I lived in a sketchy part of my city, and I live alone. From time to time, I invite a few friends and classmates over. I lived in a fairly large place, and money was getting tight, so I figured I should get a roommate. Three months ago, Sheila moved in. A little background on Sheila. This girl is kinky as hell. She would invite various men over a few times a week. Yesterday was when she drew the line when she invited a guy over and he went ahead and stole a guitar that my friend left in my place. I was furious, but also very passive aggressive. I went to my friend's house and when I came back, another guy was sitting on our couch. I got even angrier because Sheila apparently would never learn. I noticed this guy is a little shifty. I got a pretty good laugh because I also noticed that he was really high and he was trying not to die. Maybe that's why Sheila left him alone, I figure. So I went to sleep. I woke up to get ready for school this morning and I saw this guy happily eating cereal on our table. I got used to this. I sat next to him to eat my oatmeal and we ate breakfast in complete silence. Sheila came out of her room and ate breakfast as well. So we're just silently eating there for like 15 minutes. Then this guy stood up, washed his bowl, and carefully put it in the drawer. Thank you for the cereal, ladies, he mumbled, and then quietly walked out of our apartment. I said something like, out of all the guys you invited over, at least that guy is polite. Sheila just stares at me in total confusion and says, wasn't that guy your friend? That's when it dawned on us that we had both shared a breakfast with a guy who was so high, he had entered a random house unknowingly. I'm just glad that he didn't have any ulterior motives. A month ago, I was at a pharmacy filling a prescription. I have central pain following a stroke that I had in my early 20s. I can walk, but the brain damage causes severe burning throughout my entire body. Due to this, I am on morphine and I'm seen by a specialist at a well-known hospital. I dropped off my prescription and waited. I noticed a guy behind me standing way too close. He could hear everything we said. I sat down and tested my blood pressure. I noticed him walking around the aisles nearby. I thought he was waiting too. They called my name 20 minutes later. I didn't see him while I was leaving the store. I looked in my car and got in, immediately locking my doors due to the paranoia of watching scary movies, I guess. I stopped at the first stop sign and out from behind a tree jumps this same guy. In one motion, he was out from behind the tree and was grabbing my passenger side door handle. Thankfully, it was locked. He seemed as shocked as I was and looked like he was grabbing for the back passenger door. Again, it was locked. I started screaming and I put my hand on my horn and sped away. Other cars were also honking. I saw him run. I drove until I saw a cop car sitting at a Carl's Jr. and I ran in. He took my info and drove to the stop sign and asked me to follow. I couldn't see him anywhere. The police officer said that the same thing happened last week to an elderly lady, so he really needed to find this guy. I was very, very lucky. Always lock your door. On Saturday, I got a call from a few friends about going to the mall. It was a really stressful week at work, so I thought some retail therapy would definitely help. We shopped for the typical stuff like makeup, lingerie, and shoes before we decided on hitting the food hall for a spot of lunch. I gave the girls my order and told them I would come and find them as I needed to use the restroom. The restrooms at the end of a large and wide corridor were your typical mall type with lots of stalls. 
I sat down, and I could see from the gap on the floor between the wall of the stall and the floor that there was a lot of movement going on and somebody's shadow. I wasn't sure if it was somebody getting changed or not, so I didn't pay a lot of attention at first. But there were times when it felt like the shadow was coming from above me at some points. You know, as if the light above were being obstructed by something. After maybe the third time, I decided to look up and see what I could see. What I saw was a phone and a part of a guy's arm leaning over. Someone was taking photos of me. I instantly shouted, What the fuck, you pervert? And in a moment of sheer shock and disbelief, my rage turned to fear as I got up and leapt out of the stall and was greeted by an empty bathroom. Not a single person was in sight, and from the quick glance of the mirrors opposite, there was only one stall shut, the one next to mine. I ran for the restroom exit, but it was locked. Luckily, it had a twist lock that I could turn, and as I did, I heard a stall open from behind me. I got out immediately and turned as I exited, and I noticed a sign on the door saying closed for maintenance. That sign was not there when I went in. Somebody followed me into that restroom, put a maintenance sign up, and locked me in with them. I screamed some more, shouting to get everybody's attention, anyone's attention, as I ran down the corridor toward the food hall. Obviously, I did catch the attention of a few people. A group of three guys stopped me and could clearly see the panic in my eyes. They quizzed me, I explained, and two ran toward the ladies' room and one to find security. Security arrived within seconds. After a while, a rather large crowd had gathered due to the commotion, and although I was in the comfort of my friends, security, and now the police, I had never felt more alone. Neither security, the police, or any of the guys found anyone. There were a few staff-only and fire exit doors down the corridor, so plenty of escape routes for whoever this guy was to go through. I gave my statement down at the station later that day once my parents showed up. The police said that they had security tapes from the CCTV cameras that pointed down the corridor and would keep us updated with any news. Hopefully, they find him. I was reminded of this recently, but it happened over 10 years ago. I was living in my first apartment, alone. It was a third floor studio with vaulted ceilings in a huge complex that promoted itself as a community with socials planned and picnics and playgrounds amongst the buildings. Staff would drive around on golf carts waving hello. It felt like a safe place. So one day I called up maintenance because my AC wasn't working. A man comes up to look at it. He's short, but kind of wiry looking maybe in his late forties and leathery, like he's spent most of his life in the sun. He's in overalls, has a bushy mustache, all smiles. He's inside my apartment with a screwdriver looking at the AC, and we're just making chit-chat. All seems innocent enough, until he stands upright, says it's fixed, and takes a step toward me. He's looking at me in the eyes while he flips his screwdriver, suddenly not so friendly anymore. Then he says, You know what I think? I think you're pretty naive to be living in an apartment all by yourself. Here you've let a strange man into your apartment. You even let me close the door. Anything could happen. I could feel the smile melting off my face, but I tried not to let on that I was afraid. I kind of laughed and said, <laughs> Yeah, that's what my boyfriend said when I told him I was calling you guys. He insisted he come over. He'll be here any second, and here you guys have already finished. <laughs> You'll probably run into him on the stairwell. After that, he left abruptly, and I locked the deadbolt after him. I'd lied about my boyfriend coming over, but immediately called him to make it almost the truth. 
At the time, I thought I was overreacting, and I didn't mention it to anybody. Looking back ten years later, I realized just how sinister what he was saying really was. I've dealt with the paranormal side ever since I can remember, but this is the story that happened in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. My wife and I moved in sometime in September of 2014. We bought the home at auction and it needed a lot of work. The home was built in 1969 and it was all original to that date, even down to the shag carpets. The house sat on 12 acres with only three acres cleared around the home other than some random trees. The rest was fully wooded. The basement was gross and musty. The ceilings were low in places with the pipes and ductwork running throughout. It had an odd feeling when walking down there. The previous owners left a deep freezer and what they had inside of it made me question the things they were doing in the basement. The freezer was full of different animal carcasses that had been stripped of meat random bone pieces with bits of fur still attached. There was also a gallon bucket sitting in there, just full of blood. Our very first night staying there, my brother and sister decided to stay over with us. We were all hanging out anyway, and it got late, so they just decided to stay. While we were there, we were unpacking boxes and decorating for Halloween. I started walking the empty boxes and totes down to the basement. And while down there, something caught my eye. I saw what looked like a slim box sitting on top of the ductwork. I walked over and pulled the box down. And sure enough, it was an old 70s Ouija board. Not thinking too much about it, I grabbed it and brought it upstairs and sat it in our dining room hutch for decoration. The night was getting late. We were all getting tired. It had to have been around midnight. We decided to head up to the second floor and go to bed. All the bedrooms were dispersed on the second floor. My wife and I took the master bedroom and my brother and sister took rooms of their own. We laid there trying to doze off when suddenly we heard what sounded like the closet doors sliding and slamming shut and the sound of running and stomping back and forth in the hallway. My wife had me get up to tell my brother and sister to stop and that we were trying to sleep. I get up and I go to each of their rooms and I ask what they're doing and that people are trying to sleep. They said, we thought it was you guys. I decided to grab my gun thinking, okay, maybe somebody broke into the house. I slowly walked downstairs, clearing each room as I went along. My wife, brother and sister followed behind with a gun of their own. We cleared every room, but there was no one in the house. Suddenly, it dawns on my sister. It's the Ouija board, she said. I quickly grabbed it from the hutch cabinet and took it back to the basement, and it was silent for the rest of the night. As time went on, the spirit was making itself known. We would have to block the basement door shut because we were constantly finding it open. Anytime we had to go down into the basement, we felt its presence. This thing was demonic. We would hear it walk up to the second floor and walk around the bedrooms. Doors would randomly slam shut. The lights would surge randomly. I began to see this dark shadow figure. It wasn't just any spirit. It was dark. Like I said, it felt demonic. I felt like I was losing my mind. Voices were constantly in my head. Sometimes they were whispers, other times they were louder, but they always sounded muffled. I couldn't ever make out what they were saying, but it was all the time. The only time the voices weren't in my head was when I wasn't home. We had chickens and a sheep that died for no reason. All of our vehicles constantly had problems, down to the mower. One day I was putting laundry away, I had the windows open to catch a summer breeze because our HVAC didn't work very well. And I heard a strange sound. So I looked to the window 
and listen. It was coming from the right side, inside the woods. It got closer and closer, and then that's when I saw it. It was either a hellhound or a werewolf or something like that, walking through our front yard and disappearing into the woods on the other side. I was so shocked. One random night, we were watching a movie. The light surged and we heard the basement door slowly opening. I jumped up and wedged the door shut with a chair. Another night, I walked past the basement door to find it open, with no lights on, and I heard my wife down there calling my name. I thought it was really strange. Something just seemed wrong about it, so I didn't go down there. Then, I heard walking above me. Slowly, I walked up the stairs to the second floor, and I made my way up them. When I turned the corner, I found my wife in our room. She was the one that was walking upstairs, while I was hearing her call me from the basement. I told her about this, and we both thought it was really wild. I mean, what did it want me in the basement for? The presence continued, and it was making us feel on edge. Tired, I was hardly sleeping. I tossed and turned, and the voices grew louder and louder, yet I could never make out what they were saying. After a few years, we decided to put the house up for sale. My father-in-law was coming over to help work on a few things before the house hit the market. While he was there, the door slammed shut, and the voices started in his head. He even said that he couldn't make out what they were saying. Eventually, we moved out, and the voices, which had never been present before that house, went away entirely, and have never come back since. While I do believe in the supernatural and paranormal phenomena, I am still the sort to look for a logical explanation to things. I do believe that whatever gives humans that spark of life remains after the body gives out. I also believe in the possibility of elemental spirits, spirits far older than humanity that are connected to the Earth itself, like the Fae. We were over at my in-law's house in Charlotte, North Carolina this past Saturday. And while I sat at the dining room table chatting with my mother-in-law, out of my peripheral vision on the left side, I saw and felt something whiz by me. It was at least 12 inches in length, maybe longer, with spindly arms and legs and a thin body. I only saw four appendages two arms and two legs, for lack of a better word. There were no wings that I could see, and while I wouldn't really say that it was anthropomorphic, the arms and legs were positioned in a way that I would imagine them to be if someone were to lift a person in the air in a harness to fly them, hanging to the front and bent to the back. This thing had a head that was elongated and slightly rounded oval-shaped, so it was longer than it was wide, but I didn't see any facial features. The best thing that I can compare it to would be a giant stick bug with only four legs, but I am 100% certain that this was not an insect. There's no way something that large would have been in the house without anybody seeing it sooner. Plus, my mother-in-law has two cats that are prolific bug catchers. Has anyone ever encountered anything like this? When I saw it, the word fairy immediately came to mind, though I've never been one to believe in fairies. I'm just baffled as to what it might have been. I know I didn't imagine it. It was definitely there, and I heard a soft whoosh as it passed. Any thoughts would be appreciated. Thanks to the lockdown, I had lots of time to clean up my house. As I was cleaning out a filing cabinet, 
I stumbled upon a manila folder full of old ticket stubs from attractions around Southern California. I had held on to them as keepsakes. I came across a pair of Knott's Berry Farm ticket stubs from January 31st of 2009, the birthday of my girlfriend at the time. I was caught off guard when I saw these because I know for sure that we went to Disneyland for her birthday, not Knott's Berry Farm. We had our pictures taken in front of the Sleeping Beauty castle. I bought a scale model refrigerator magnet of the castle, and I have both. We bought ride pictures from Space Mountain, Thunder Mountain, and a few other rides. We went to the Haunted Mansion, but we had wished that we visited in October when it was really decked out for Halloween. We even watched the fireworks show and Phantasma toward the end of the night. For five or six years until we broke up, my girlfriend and I would talk about all the fun times that we had at Disneyland for her birthday. Like I said, I still have the refrigerator magnet, the physical photos we purchased, and the photos that we took that day on an old pre-SSD external hard drive. We have never been to Knott's Berry Farm together. I haven't been to Knott's Berry Farm since I was in high school, so I don't have any memories of that amusement park within the last two decades. I'm in my late 30s. Even stranger was that I could not find my ticket stubs for Disneyland at all. I went through that manila envelope several times, as well as the filing cabinet, looking for those ticket stubs, but I couldn't find them. So where in the world did those tickets come from? And where did the Disneyland ones go? I don't know if this is some kind of glitch in the matrix or what, but it really freaks me out. About eight years ago, when I was 13, I was up until 3 a.m. playing Xbox online, as you do. I remember feeling a little peckish, and I wanted some late night cereal, so I finished my game and went to go grab something to munch on. I turned on the hall lights and checked on my little brother, who was nine at the time, and my little sister, who was five. Being the oldest sibling, it was just something I would do. They were both fast asleep. As I got to the top of the staircase, I started to hear a little girl talking to herself. It completely creeped me out, but I thought maybe it was my sister sleep talking. But then it was even clearer, and I could really hear the sound of this girl's voice, and it was not my sister. I heard the voice coming from downstairs, and I got this horrible, sickening feeling inside my stomach. I got on my knees on the top of the staircase, and put my head down the stairs a little to hear the voice clearer. Then I figured that the voice was coming from the kitchen. Maybe she sensed I was there, because after that, when I tried to hear her even clearer, she laughed and I heard footsteps run off. I absolutely freaked out and ran into my mom and dad's room, telling them what had happened, but they both just told me to go back to bed. Needless to say, I did not get that bowl of cereal or sleep much that night. It was only a few weeks ago, now that I'm 21, that my mom has told me about the little girl who lives in our house. She says she feels her presence every now and then, mainly at the bottom of the stairs, which makes sense, as our two dogs now and our old dog used to stare up the staircase at nothing and sometimes bark like crazy. To this day, when I watch TV, I sometimes feel her looking at me from the stairs, although I've never heard or experienced anything quite like I did when I was younger. My great-grandfather built this cabin in Michigan in the Upper Peninsula in the mid to late 1950s. The cabin's kind of run down, but kept up well enough that a lot of family members still go up there to this day to just relax and unwind, hike through the forest, or even do some fishing on the lake. 
I've only had a couple of experiences with this place, but they have stuck with me for years. The first takes place many, many years ago when I was just a kid. The cabin has two bedrooms. The biggest is usually designated for the adults or couples while the kids get the smaller rooms where a couple of bunk beds have been set up. On this night, I'm sleeping alone in the kids' room and it's raining hard. We're talking thunder, lightning, wind. It was a lot. I was having a hard time sleeping and was just on the edge of finally passing out when suddenly, bam, someone, something, whatever, had slammed into the wall right next to my bed. It was so loud that it startled me awake. You might think, oh, it's a log cabin. The wood was just settling or, oh, it was probably wind from the storm. One, I asked several family members and they have all told me that the cabin is solid as a rock. And if the wood is settling, there's no reason it would make that loud of a noise. Two, the wall was inside the cabin. It shared a wall with the living room. Also, this same incident happened to me several nights in a row like that. Middle of the night, bam, and it would scare me awake. This second incident involves my parents and I. We're a small family. I have no brothers or sisters. Also, this cabin is on a fairly large plot of land. There's at least three miles between us and the next property. So when I say we were alone, I mean, we were alone. My mother and I were sitting at the kitchen table while my father was cooking breakfast. The kitchen is open to the table and my mom and I were just watching my father cook while we were all chatting. There was a lull in the talking and I hear a man's voice coming from the attic. At first I thought it was my dad or that I was just going crazy, but I didn't see my dad say anything. And when I looked at my mom, she had the same terrified expression on her face that I probably had. I don't know what the man said, and neither does my mom, but the thought of that voice more or less calling down to us from the attic freaks me out to this day. The cabin is still great though, and whatever is there doesn't seem evil. It just likes to make its presence known from time to time. I live about a mile or two from an old abandoned school that is very haunted. I've heard a few stories about it, and I have an experience there that I would like to share with you. It's a relatively short story, but it freaked me the hell out. I pass this school every time I drive home from work at night, and one night I got home pretty late, like around midnight. Anyway, I was passing the school, and there was a dead cat in the road. I turned around and pulled over in front of the intersection, directly across from the school. I had a friend with me, and we'll call him Chance. We got out of my truck and examined the body of the cat. As I was walking over, I looked up at the school just for a look, just seeing if I saw anything because of how late it was. I didn't, and we continued on to the cat. What we saw was pretty gruesome, I'll spare you. But I went back to my truck and grabbed some wipes I had tucked behind the front seat. It's a single cab, so I put things back there that I don't always need up front. Anyway, I put a few in the palms of my hands, completely covering them, so that I could safely pick up the cat and move it to some bushes to the left of the intersection. Chance and I walked back to the truck without glancing at the school a second time, until we were back in the truck putting on our seatbelts, in shock because of what we'd just seen. But it gets worse. I glance at the school one more time before putting it in drive, and there was a man and a woman standing directly in front of the school, just standing there, staring at the school while holding hands. Chance is looking at his phone, so I tap his shoulder to get his attention. I say to him, bro, look, and we just freeze for a second. I didn't see them at all when I glanced at the school before, and I would have at least seen them walking toward the front of the school when I had first walked over to the cat, 
The school's pretty wide and it takes a minute to get to where this couple was standing. They just appeared out of thin air. Once that hit me, I put it in drive and drove up the road to the point where I could turn around and start heading home. Creeping by the school intersection, we looked to see if they were still there, and they were. As we passed the intersection, the man turned around quickly and stared directly at us. I have never floored my truck as hard as I did that night. I actually spun the tires when I took off. We made it back home in no time and pulled into the driveway and just sat there for a minute, contemplating what we'd just seen. Eventually, we got our wits together and went in, and Chance asked if he could just stay the night, and I agreed. I didn't want to go past that school again, so I didn't want him to. This happened over a month ago. Chance and I have had a falling out, and I haven't had any more experiences driving past that school. But that incident still messes with me to this day. This one day, I had a really weird experience by a school. I spent the beginning of that day at the rundown school's basketball court. Everything about it was odd, but fun. I was enjoying myself, and I was new to the city, and so my neighbor and I were just walking around. You know that saying, time flies when you're having fun? Well, that's exactly what it was. Due to my home life, it was easy for me to pick up on the vibe of the area, and when it changed, it got dark really fast. The vibe of that basketball court went from fun and happy to... I guess the right word would be sinister. Like the air itself was heavier. My neighbor called my name and I walked over. He was trying to introduce me to some group of guys. But before I got over there, I've already peeped out that he's nervous. The guy that's doing all of the talking is trying to tell me how the area worked and how the groups were and how you had to belong somewhere and had to prove yourself. He gives us this ultimatum and said that my neighbor and I had to fight and that whoever won basically would have a chance to try out for this group and no wasn't an option. I was nervous and scared, but I was surrounded and I didn't know what to do. Anywhere that I could have run, I would have been cut off by someone. The only thing that my mind could think of was that I needed help. They walked us to the school at gunpoint and this whole time, this guy is in a full-on monologue. Now, we're by some lockers, and we were cut off with no exit, when all of us heard this growling, loud growling. A very large dog, about the size of a Great Dane, came out from the dark area of the hallway we were in. There was really no way it could have gotten over there that I could see. At first, these guys were acting like gangsters, but they were terrified of the dog. And if I thought the air was heavy at first, it felt like gravity was absolutely weighing me down now. Everything stunk all of a sudden. I couldn't move. I was just standing there. And it seemed like everybody was now standing behind me, and this dog had come up beside me. I couldn't see it very well. My eyes were blurry from tears. When it jumped, the two guys with guns started shooting. Only thing I could think to do was fall and get up and run. I thought I was shot, so I'm running through this wooded area, but I was too afraid to stop because I thought I'd die if I did. I made it home, and my shirt and pants had blood on it, but it wasn't mine. I stayed in the house for a couple of weeks, hiding, expecting police to come and question me. I told my dad, but he didn't care. About the third week, that same neighbor and his mom knocked on the door. He came to apologize and told me that it was a setup. His leg and chest and arm were bandaged and he said it was the dog. The guy that had done all the talking had passed away. Both he and the other person with the gun shot at each other. The dog did the rest. The dog caught up with him while he was running through the wooded area after me. He said he was asking for forgiveness because he couldn't sleep. 
that every time he tried, he could hear that dog growling, and he was afraid to walk outside because he could hear it. We never spoke again after that day, obviously, no matter how many classes we had together. I found out later that year that the school we were at was abandoned and was widely considered haunted by the locals. I went there on the regular to see the dog often. It was really the only place that I could get peace from home and the rest of the world. Never got too close to it, but I never really felt like I was in danger either. After all, that dog saved my life. This happened about nine or ten years ago, but it's something that I've never figured out, and maybe something I'll never figure out, but it has stuck with me all this time. Let me preface this by saying that I do get sleep paralysis. I've had more instances of sleep paralysis than I can count, but I'll say an average of four times a year for the past 30 years. Some years it's more often, some years it's less, but by the time this experience occurred, I was well versed enough to be able to identify when it was happening and to be able to pull myself out of it. Generally, when I get sleep paralysis, I can hear everything around me, but I can't move or make a noise. I've never seen the old hag, and only once have I seen the man in the wide-brimmed hat. He had red eyes when I saw him. And yes, he was pushing down my chest. Not cool. Not fun. I never want that to happen again, but I also knew that he wasn't real as it was happening. So about 1% of the time I've had a visual hallucination. Usually it's just that I can't move or speak, but I can hear everything around me, and somehow I can see the room even though my eyes are closed. But this? It doesn't fit the mold of sleep paralysis, at least not in any way I've ever experienced it. That's why it bothered me so much then, and why it still bothers me now. My son was young at the time, five or six. My then husband, now ex, and I drove to visit my grandmother for Christmas. She lives about a hundred miles away from me. She has two extra bedrooms, but other family members scooped up the extra rooms before we could. So my husband and I rented a hotel room a few miles from her house. It was something like a Best Western or Holiday Inn. If I had to guess, I would say at the time it was less than 10 years old. We checked into our hotel room quickly, dropped off our stuff, and went straight to my grandmother's house. We had Christmas dinner with the family. I don't think I had any alcohol at all. If I did, it might have been one glass of wine. It was a long drive down to her house, two hours at least, and then an eventful evening, so we were beat. We left Grandma's house at about 9 p.m. and headed back to the hotel room. We drove around for an extra 20 minutes, trying to get our cranky son to sleep, which made me even more exhausted. The exhaustion is the thing that had me thinking, maybe this was sleep paralysis, because that usually does trigger it for me. But again, what happened next is like nothing I've ever experienced before or since. The layout of the room is this. The hotel room door opened up to a little hallway, and directly to the left was the bathroom with a tiny closet next to it. Moving just past the hallway, the wall on the left turned 90 degrees and the beds were to the left. To the right, you could follow the wall straight to the corner. There was a dresser along that wall, and in the corner was an armchair. From that corner, follow that wall, and there was a window facing the parking lot. In the next corner, there was another armchair, maybe three feet from the head of one of the queen beds. That was where my husband and I slept. My husband slept on the side near the armchair, and I slept on the inside so I could be closer to our son in the other bed. My son fell asleep in the car. I tucked him in and very quickly got changed and got in bed. My husband got in bed only moments later, and I shut the lights off. Before I fell asleep, I observed that the light from the parking lot peeked in over the top and around the sides of the window curtain. 
It was brighter than I would have imagined with the curtain drawn, but I was too exhausted for it to bother me, so I passed out pretty quickly. Sometime in the middle of the night, I hear the click of a door handle turning. It was the lever kind. I was alarmed, but my body was still heavy with sleep. I'm also facing the direction of the door. I watch as the orange light from the hotel hallway slides across the wall opposite of me and then slowly disappears as the door closes again, quietly. I felt like I was passing in and out of sleep, so the sight of this almost had a strobing effect. A young man wearing medium blue baggy jeans and no shirt walked past the ends of our beds. At this point, I'm more alert, but I'm laying in bed trying to figure out if this is real or not. It was so vivid. But I also had this feeling that I was still passing in and out of consciousness. From the moment I heard the click of the door handle, I was scared out of my mind, but still so tired. I wanted to get up. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't tell what was holding me in bed, whether it was fear or exhaustion. At this point, the man is behind me. I can feel him looking at me, but I'm absolutely terrified to turn over. If I turn over, will it spook him? Will he attack my family? Right now, I can tell he's not moving, just looking. I finally feel alert enough, and I realize my eyes are closed. What? But I can feel him in the room. I saw him, even though I had no way to. It was the scariest thing I've ever done because I knew I might be facing an attacker in my hotel room, but I forced my eyes open and turned over. Nothing. There's no one in the room. My heart is racing. I mean, Jesus, that was so real. I look at my husband and he's fast asleep with his back turned to me, snoring gently. My son is asleep. Everything is how it was when I fell asleep. I'm still on my back, looking at the armchair in the corner at the end of the beds, with the soft white light of the parking lot falling onto the chair as I calm down enough to fall back asleep. I can't tell you how much time passed, but it was dark. And then, all of a sudden, I see the armchair in the corner at the foot of the bed again. But this time, the man that had entered the room earlier was sitting in it. With the light shining from the window, I can see him a little bit better. It's a soft light, but I can tell his hair is buzzed short, and it's a dark brown. He looks young, maybe 18 to 25. He's either white with a tan or perhaps Hispanic. I can't see his facial features too well, but he could be a model. I don't know celebrities well enough to be able to compare him to somebody but he had strong cheekbones, sort of a perfect straight nose, and a strong jaw. Like I said, it was too dark to see the details, but this is what I gathered from his silhouette. He was just sitting there, calmly staring at me. He didn't feel threatening or menacing, but I was still scared out of my mind, because there's a guy in my room in the middle of the night staring at me. This time, the line between asleep and awake is even blurrier in my head. Am I asleep? Are my eyes even open? I don't know, but I'm afraid to find out. I can feel my husband asleep next to me, so I decide the best move is to try to discreetly wake him. He's still snoring with his back turned to me, but my hand is on the bed next to his back, so I decided to slowly move my hand closer and poke him. I poked him a few times, but he's passed out and not reacting at all. I was so pissed. I mean, he was dead to the world. Finally, I decided, F this. I'm not dealing with this alone anymore. So I turned toward my husband slightly, and I lift myself onto my elbow. This is where I'm sure I'm awake, but everything before that was blurry. I was about to grab his arm and shake the hell out of him when I noticed the man in the corner, in the chair, is no longer there. Now I feel crazy. I mean, what's going on? Where is this guy? Is he real or not? I was so tired, 
frustrated, confused, and scared. This man felt real. The details were so vivid. But as I'm trying to sift through what was real and what wasn't, I realize I can only see or feel this guy when I'm asleep. I pray to myself that this is the end of it, and I finally convinced myself that it was just my brain creating an elaborate lucid dream and that I was safe. I was convinced it should stop now, because it's just a stupid dream, and now that I know it, I have the power. I rolled toward my husband, facing his back. I closed my eyes and started to drift off to sleep. I swear it was only a few minutes later, and this time I couldn't see anything, but I felt the guy looking at me. This time though, while sitting in the chair that's three feet away from my husband's head, not the other one. I opened my eyes. No one was there. For the rest of the night, I probably woke up every hour or so. Every time I fell asleep, I could feel this man's presence in the room. He never tried to hurt us, he just watched us. All night. When I finally saw daylight through the curtains, I got up and woke my husband up and I told him we had to leave. I tried not to alarm him or my son. I just got them up and dressed and said we were out. I think we were out of there by 7.30 in the morning. This whole thing had such a surreal quality to it, because with the exception of a few distinct moments, it was hard to tell when my eyes were open and when they were closed, when I was fully conscious, and when I was maybe semi-conscious. There were parts that I could write off as a dream if they weren't so damn vivid. And the whole night, this lingering feeling of being watched, even when I couldn't see him, was so unnerving. Every time I recount this incident to myself or someone else, I'm no closer to understanding what happened, but I refuse to go back to that hotel. I've always been able to see hear, feel, and communicate with spirits. But this particular one, during my Christmas travels, specifically spooked me. It's rare that I see people while I'm driving. But this thing looked blue. I don't know, like he had a blue light to him. And it was a man that was approximately 5'10", and I'd say around 150 to 170 pounds. I saw him on the side of the road going southbound on I-95 in Brevard County, Florida. He had on these loose, very worn out Levi's and work boots. He was wearing a trucker cap and a loose t-shirt that I think may have been like a deep burnt sienna or a light brown. It was hard to tell because of that blue glow. He had brown hair and brown eyes and a brown goatee. Does anyone happen to know of anything that happened in the area with a man who matches this description? I just want to know who this is. About three years ago, I moved to London. I was looking for a flatmate, but had no luck. I turned to my friend Marcus. After a week or two, Marcus and I moved in together. After we moved in, he put some of his stuff in storage so that he could make room for me in his flat. When I moved in, everything was fine and well. Fast forward about a year. I went to go get some stuff out of the storage locker that Marcus put his stuff in. As I opened the door, an absolutely rank scent hit me like a bat. I switched the light on, and I saw a couple of old boxes and a couch. I was looking for the source of the smell, but I couldn't find it. I grabbed what I came for and left before I could vomit. Now fast forward to about a month ago. I went back to that storage unit to get something else, and the smell was even worse than before. I had to hold my nose as I walked into the unit. I saw an open box and I decided to look into it. I found stuffed animals. 
Not like cute little toys, like dead animals that had been stuffed. I looked into the box under that one and I found rotting animals. I was completely disgusted. I went to Marcus and confronted him. As I walked into the flat, I shouted, Marcus, why the fuck are there dead animals in our storage locker? He came out of his room and sat me down on the couch. He told me he wanted to be completely honest with me. And it was at that point that he told me that he was into necrophilia. Let's just say that I'm now moved in with my parents. My dad was out for a job interview, so my sister and I had the place to ourselves for about two hours. I watched TV downstairs and went outside, and when I went back in, I left the door unlocked for my dad since it was getting close to the time he said he'd be home. I went upstairs and hung out with my sister for a while. I heard the front door open and rummaging through the cabinets. I just assumed that it was my dad since he always likes to check that everything is in place before he relaxes. I also heard my dad's door open and close, albeit slowly, a few times. I was talking with my sister when the phone rang. To my surprise, it was my dad on the other end. He told me that he was going to be getting home late and that we needed to make our own dinners. It felt like my heart fell to my feet as he said that. I realized that it was not my dad who had entered the home. I hurriedly rushed downstairs to see if everything was okay. Several things were gone and the front door was wide open. I then heard what sounded like breathing coming from the downstairs bathroom. I choked the urge to yell back as I saw a hand wrap around the door and a face peer around the corner. As soon as the guy saw me, he ran like hell out of there. I chased after him, but he was long gone. On the floor in the bathroom, I found later, of all things, a box cutter knife. I'm not sure what his intentions were with that weapon, but I know they can't be good. I had to do my practice in my school as a librarian for three months. Every morning, I used to sweep and mop the library floor and then start to arrange the books on the shelves. Then I would key in all of the new book entries on the computer. I had the habit of bringing a bottle of holy water with me and I would place it on the table where I sit. Since it was the major exam month, the library would be lonely as the students and the teachers would be going back from school to their houses after one paper that day. Only some students and teachers would come to the library to study and borrow books. Most of the time though, I would be alone in the library, so I would play some music as I arranged the books on the shelves. One day, as I was taking the log books out from the drawer, I accidentally spilled some holy water on the floor. To my shock, that area started to smoke a little. Although it was hard to see with the naked eye, I sensed that something was amiss in the library that day. As soon as I got up, in shock, the media room doorknob behind me started to twist and turn frantically. I stood in my place and looked over the counter to check if someone was there. I saw a shadow at the bottom of the door. I rushed out of the library and walked over to the media room which was just next door to the library, and turned the doorknob slowly. It was locked. No one could have been in there. So whose shadow did I see? In college, I lived with my mom and aunt. We had a house on a hill in the woods. You had to drive up to get to the garage, and the front yard sloped down to the left. 
to expose all the floors of a pretty turret on the side of the house. To get to the front door, you had to step onto a wooden walkway that followed along the whole left side of the garage. There were about four feet between the bottom of the walkway and the ground underneath at the door. I got home late one night and saw my aunt's light was still on. She was a night owl, like me. I pulled in, parked, and walked up to the front door. It was dark, but I could still see that there was something wrong with the doorknob. It was hanging out of the door, and the screws were mostly out. I unlocked the deadbolt, locked it again, and went upstairs to ask my aunt what had happened to the knob. She was really confused and told me she'd just been out there smoking and that it was fine. I told her it was broken, and she argued that it couldn't be because she had literally been out there only a minute before and hadn't even seen me pull in because she was still walking up the stairs to her room. We both go back downstairs and I show her the door. Her face turned white, and we realized that in the time between her shutting the door and me getting to it, someone had tried to break in by pulling the locks out. We had many more instances after that with someone stalking us, but we never did find out who it was. When I was 15, I traveled to Europe with my family. We stayed in Ital, Germany, in a small inn for a few nights. My parents had a double bed on the second floor. My sisters had the double bedroom next to theirs, and I was lucky enough to have a single room all to myself at the far end of the hall. When we went to check into our rooms, as soon as I entered the hallway, I remember almost feeling as though I had walked into a wall of sorts, of bad energy. I just felt so unnerved and uneasy in that hallway, but I passed it off as an overactive imagination. I slept the first night without any issues, other than waking up a few times. The next morning at breakfast, one of my sisters mentioned feeling really uncomfortable in the hallway, almost as if the air was crushing her. It unnerved me even more that I wasn't the only one who felt weirded out. Plus, she was an adult at the time, so it further cemented in my head that the wing of the hotel was odd at least. Later that night, I'm sleeping peacefully, when at about 2 a.m., I'm awoken by something ripping the covers off of me and being jerked about two feet toward the end of the bed by my ankles. At first, I thought somebody had broken into my room because when I turned toward what had grabbed me, a huge looming dark shape was visible. It was darker than the darkness. It was like a man was in my room. I frantically flipped on the light, only to find that absolutely nothing was there. The window was locked from the inside. There was nobody in the closet or in the bathroom, and my room was also still locked from the inside. I stayed up the rest of the night, scared, playing on my DS. The next morning, we're at breakfast, and my sister mentions that she was up half the night because she thought she saw a person silhouetted against the wall of the room. But when she turned the light on, there was nobody there. It was just such a bizarre and creepy experience. We checked out that day, so I didn't get to experience anything after that. But I think I'm all right with that, because it still freaks me out to this day. This incident happened to my mom before she had me, over 20 years ago. She worked at a local pub at the time, and the pub mainly catered for fishermen, as the town is on the coast of Western Australia. She knew most of the people who would come in for drinks or for a meal. However, every now and again, people from town would come in, and she told me that one bloke used to come in who she'd known from house parties around the place. He always wanted to talk to her while she was working, and she would say sorry, she couldn't, and would keep on doing her thing. One night, she finished work at about midnight, 
and walked home, which was a few kilometers away. She lived with a few housemates who were blokes, all good mates. When she got home from her shift, she decided to have a shower. Making her way back to her room, she realized her door was open and it's normally shut. All of the guys were asleep, so she just blew it off as the wind or something. She laid down in bed to go to sleep, but something didn't feel right. And for reasons she can't explain, she felt the need to look under her bed. What she saw was the guy from the bar who had followed her all the way from her work. She tells me that she just stared at him for what felt like ages, and he didn't even move, not even a breath, to the point that she thought he was dead. Somehow, she calmly went out of the room and went to one of the guys' rooms to tell them that she had a dead guy under her bed. They raced in with baseball bats to find the guy halfway out the window. He managed to escape and run away. The police were called, and because they all knew who he was, the cops picked him up the next day. When I was 20 and in the army, I was sent to my first duty station in Germany. The barracks we lived in were converted old five-story buildings that were supposedly once the headquarter buildings for the Nazi party. From what we were told, the basement of the building that I lived in had been converted into our armory. However, it had supposedly once been filled with ovens and gas chambers. Apparently, a lot of people died in that building. There were all kinds of underground tunnels below our caserna that had outbuildings on base that, of course, were off limits, but that, of course, we snuck into anyway. Aside from the underground tunnels, the building that we lived in was super creepy. I was on the very top floor. My friends and I would be in a room watching a movie and the doors would just fling open. We all had really strange experiences. I would always get woken up regularly by something nudging me and calling my name. I would wake up and see figures in my room and hear footsteps in the attic above my room almost every night. It became normal for me. As I'm writing this, I'm getting creeped out. My Google mini home device just started talking to me out of the blue and said, I like it better when you ask me questions. Okay then, moving on. So one night around 2 or 3 a.m., I am woken up by a nudge, and I see all these lights on in the hallway from under the bedroom door. Then I hear tons of people walking in the hallway, like a crowd of people. I thought, what the heck, are we having an alert? Alerts are random deployment readiness inspections very early in the morning. I thought maybe we had one and nobody told me. I throw on my uniform and open my door, and it's completely dark. No lights are on, nobody's in the hallway. I thought I was going crazy. It's the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. I really just stood there in shock. I had no clue what was going on, so I just went back to bed thinking I'd lost my mind. I never told my friends because I didn't want them to think I was losing it. I thought I was losing it. I guess it could all be attributed to dreaming, sleepwalking, half dream kind of things. I mean, I know there's a reasonable explanation for everything, right? But honestly, in my heart, I know those barracks were haunted. I am a part-time custodian for the town that I live in, and I only work when I'm needed. I have pretty much worked at every school in the district, including the middle school that I attended. It's a fairly old school, built in the early 60s, and is actually being torn down in about a year to make room for the new middle school that will be replacing it. I love that school, and I never want to see it go, but it's kind of a dump. But every time I get the opportunity to go back and work there again, I always accept it. I have always been a firm believer in ghosts and I've had a handful of experiences, but I've never experienced anything at that building before. 
until last winter. I was working a three-night stint at the old middle school on the second floor from about 2 p.m. to 9 p.m. Quite frankly, I didn't need seven hours to go about the nightly routine of cleaning, but I was fine with that. On the first night, I went about my business knowing I could pace myself, but I was still flying through my work. I'm not overly social when I work night shifts. I actually like them better because most people are gone by 5 p.m., and I can just have my headphones in and listen to music, podcasts, or whatever. It was probably about 5 p.m. when I was sweeping the classroom floors in the science wing. All of the doors were shut and locked, which is mandatory in the science wing, with the lights shut off in the rooms, meaning that all the teachers had gone home for the night. Now this detail is important. I have a system when it comes to cleaning rooms, and it's very simple. When I've done everything that needs to be done in a room, I shut the lights off in that room. But when I know that I have to go back into a room for whatever reason, whether it be a stain on the floor that needs to be mopped or a rug that needs to be vacuumed, I leave the lights on in that room as a reminder to circle back at some point. There was one room in that wing that needed a wet mop pretty badly, so I left the lights on and the door open, and I figured that when I was cleaning the bathroom floors in that wing later on, I would make a stop in that room and give it a quick mop. At this point, it's probably about 7 p.m., and I've just finished taking a break with my coworker Jeff, who works on the first floor. I go upstairs to my closet and gather my bathroom cleaning supplies. About 30 minutes later, I make my way back to the science wing to clean the bathrooms and that classroom floor. When I get down to the classroom, I notice that not only is the door shut with the lights off, but the door is locked. Now I know this wasn't me. I never close the classroom doors until I go around to shut the hallway lights off at the very end of the night, just in case I need to go back into a room. I'm also positive that no teachers were left in the building. I unlock the door and the lights are flipped in the off position, so I flip them back on. I immediately ran downstairs to ask Jeff if he had been in the science wing at all in the last hour, and he said no. I asked if there had been any teachers meeting in the main office or the teacher's lounge, and the answer was also no. I told him what happened, and he wasn't surprised at all, saying he thinks that building is haunted. We talked for another minute or two, and I went back upstairs to the classroom. And what do you know, the lights are off again. I always try to debunk every experience that I have, but I cannot for the life of me think of anything that would have caused these things to happen. It was the middle of December, and the building was always cold, so there were no windows open, and I made sure of that. I have no explanations for the light flipping off twice, and no explanation for the door locking on its own. I walk around the entire upstairs, looking in every classroom, trying to find any sign that some teachers could have still been in the building, but I found nothing. I went back to mop the classroom floor and finished the rest of my work for the night. Night two was uneventful, but night three, in my opinion, was the most eventful. The whole night, I had this feeling of somebody watching me, and not your normal feeling of being watched, but more like I was being followed, especially once all of the faculty and students were gone. One could normally chalk this up to paranoia, but this feeling only worsened. I thought I heard footsteps around me a few times. Not heavy footsteps. They were more like light shuffling. I ended up back at the science wing bathrooms. Now these bathrooms are faculty only, and the doors are always shut. They both open just simply by pushing on the door. No knobs or levers to turn. But the women's room on the left doesn't normally shut all the way. It stays propped open on its own, about half an inch, unless you forcefully pull it all the way closed. I always start with the men's room on the right. I go in and out of the boys' room a few times to grab things off my cart. At one point, I open the boys' room door and take two or three steps in, when suddenly the door to the girls' room slams shut. It wasn't just a normal slam. This was loud to the point where I jumped, 
and I don't scare easily. I go back into the hall and the door is all the way shut. I open the door to the girls' room, certain that nobody's actually in there, but just to be safe, I do my normal, hello, is anyone in there? Custodial needs to come in, with the door just cracked open. No response. I open the door fully, and both stalls are open and there's nobody inside. I lean back into the hallway and I shout for Jeff, thinking that he's somehow pulling a prank on me, slamming the door and then running into a nearby classroom or something. But then it occurred to me, these bathrooms are pretty far removed from any classrooms in both directions. If it was Jeff or a kid or anybody playing a prank, I would have seen them. A few seconds after shouting to whoever may have been listening, I swear I heard faint whispers. The problem was, I couldn't tell which direction they were coming from. It was like they were all around me. I asked them to speak up, and they suddenly went silent. I must have spent 10 minutes playing with that door, trying to figure out what could have caused it to slam so hard. There are no windows that could have blown it shut, and the only vent in the room is on the other side of the room, and it doesn't blow hard enough to move the door with that kind of force, if at all. I quickly finished my work in the bathrooms and I swept the hallway floors so I could finish up for the night. Once I was finished, I took one final walk around to shut off any classroom lights and lock any doors that might have been left open. I also went to shut off the hallway lights. While doing this, I made sure that I did not have my headphones in. If something wanted my attention, I was going to make sure they got it. Nothing happened while I made my final rounds upstairs, so I went downstairs to find Jeff. I asked him about the bathroom door slamming and where he was around that time. He told me he was in the sixth grade classrooms by the kitchen, which is on the first floor and on the opposite side of the building. He also said that he had never experienced the bathroom door do anything weird before, but then again, he never really worked in the upstairs wings before. I walked with Jeff, talking to him about random stuff as he went around shutting off the lights. It's probably around 9.15 at this point. Yes, we were there a little late at this point, but we didn't really mind. As we made our way down near the music wing, something urged me to look back down the hall from which we'd come. So I did just that. I turned to look and I still get chills and smile like a madman when I think about what I saw. I saw a dark gray transparent figure, shaped like a person, walking from left to right down the hall toward the gym. I immediately start running down the hall to try to see it again, but I played it off to Jeff like I thought I saw a real person and was going to direct them out of the building, but I know what I saw. There were no people in the building. There were no basketball practices, no extracurriculars going on that late, and there should have been absolutely nobody else in the building at all. I turn the corner and I don't see anybody. I check all the bathrooms and there's no one. I checked farther down the hall around the corner and there was nothing. I looked outside to the front plaza, but there wasn't a soul, no people, no cars, nothing. At this point, I honestly got teary-eyed, but not because I was upset or scared, because I was happy. To that point in my life, those were the most intense experiences I had ever had with the paranormal. I firmly believed that someone was trying to contact me over those three days. Jeff and I finished up and went home. I have since been back to that school a handful of times, but unfortunately, I have never had any truly great experiences like I did those three nights other than the shadows that we all sometimes see out of the corners of our eyes, but who really knows for sure if those are spirits. They were nothing like the walking figure that I saw, so I chalked them up to my mind playing tricks on me. But like I said, who could be sure? The woman who normally works the upstairs wing of that school doesn't believe my stories. She's worked there for 11 years and says she's never experienced anything in that building before, but she's also one of the most closed-minded people I've ever met. 
She doesn't believe in ghosts and won't even ponder the idea of aliens or life outside of our planet. She says that I only saw what I wanted to see and that my experience was what I wanted to experience. Quite frankly, I think that's bull. My theory is that since I was clearly interested in what the spirit or spirits were doing, given that I would spend significant amounts of time trying to debunk my experiences, they tried to keep my attention. Almost like they were all starved for attention. I also think it's possible that since I was in a middle school, the spirit or spirits may have been those of middle school aged kids, and they were probably just doing juvenile pranks to mess with me. When I called for the voices I was hearing, they went silent. Kind of like how students sometimes do when they get yelled at for talking during a test or something. It's all a theory, but I think those ideas make sense, and I hope that they make sense to whoever's hearing this. I know these aren't the scariest encounters, but they're very near and dear to me. Like I said, I've always believed in ghosts, and I've had some smaller encounters with what I believe were ghosts, but up until that point in my life, those were the most intense encounters I'd ever had. I've had some more encounters recently, some at another school that I believe is haunted, and maybe I'll tell those stories sometime. But for now, I'll leave it here. My grandparents moved from Ohio in the late 70s to start a life in Florida. An opportunity to manage a ranch was a dream come true for them. When I was about eight years old, I used to visit them once a month for around two weeks each to stay. I loved it. The smell of cow manure brings me to a special time in my life, but it also brings back horrifying memories. The ranch is located in Florida not much history was given to my grandparents before arriving. Shortly after, the owners started to spill the beans. Bound by contract, my grandparents had an obligation to stay for the span of 10 years. The land had some native history as well as an unfortunate side in the front of the house of the property. An old Navy sailor hung himself several years before. The land has several different ponds and trails, which made for awesome adventures. I had a lot of fun, until my strange experience. My father and I decided to go fishing at one of the more interesting ponds. At the time, I had no idea what made this pond so interesting. But later, when I was an adult, I was told why. The pond was shaped like a donut and had a small mound at the center of the pond, around 45 feet from the shore. It was perfectly centered. From my understanding, somebody was buried at the center of this pond. Not sure if this is true, mostly stories and no real evidence. But anyhow, my father and I began fishing. I grabbed my small bait caster sized rod and began to hook a worm by the hook. I used a little red and white bobber. I was the type that wanted to fish away from anyone as I thought it would raise my chance of catching something. But that day, Something caught me. I cast my line in the water and sat down right at the edge of the water with my feet slightly in it. I felt like a man with my rubber boots like my old man. About 20 minutes or so later, I noticed my bobber was going under and back up, so I decided to set my hook. As I tugged back, it felt like something big was on the line. I tugged and reeled, tugged harder and reeled, and my line wouldn't let go. It was stuck on something. At this point, my father was on the other side of the mound and out of my sight. So, in big boy fashion, I decided to walk into the water to see if I could tug it in a different direction, possibly freeing my line. I'm about four feet in, and the water was just at the edge of my knee-high boots. I'm not sure if this made sense, but it felt like it was what I was supposed to do. Finally, after tugging my line even harder, it was freed, as though nothing had ever been on it in the first place. Even the worm was still hanging off the hook. 
Feeling proud, I decided to walk out of the water and recast my line. This is where things got crazy. About a foot away from being completely out of the water, my left foot slipped on a rock. I brought my right foot forward to catch my balance, and a smaller stone dug itself into the shin of my left leg. It hurt like hell. As I realized what had just happened, I went to pull my left leg forward, but I couldn't. I felt my foot pulling back. I struggled trying to pull my leg forward, even spinning around, with my butt now in the water. I started to scream, yelling for my father. It was as if my scream fell on deaf ears. I was being pulled into the water by something. I didn't feel hands or anything actually on my foot. It's just that my leg was not free, and I was gradually going farther and farther into the water. I was screaming bloody murder at this point, and after about 20 seconds of fighting and yelling, whatever had my foot let go. I was soaked and horrified. I ran to my father, screaming, bleeding from my left leg and in somewhat of a shock. While yelling, I asked my father, why didn't you come to me when I was screaming? My father, now shaking because of what I looked like, said, son, I didn't hear any screaming. I couldn't see you from the other side. I'm calming down a little bit at this point, and I ask him again. His reply was the same. I didn't hear you, son. Needless to say, after showing my father and explaining what happened to me, like most parents would, he just shrugged it off and said that my imagination had gotten the best of me. I never fished on that property again. Nobody actually believes it happened. They all tell me that I was caught on something or I made it up or it was all in my head. And I know that this is something that sounds outlandish, but something that I couldn't see had me that day and it wanted me. I'm not here to convince anybody, just to share. So I'm a skeptic, and I don't really believe in anything supernatural, but today I had a weird experience I can't explain. I have a galley-style kitchen. I was washing dishes, and my phone was on the counter behind me. I was listening to some Mr. Revenant stories. I turned around from the sink to grab another container to wash, and noticed that my phone had gone from the video to the comments section of the video, I looked closer and noticed that it was queued up to reply to a comment. A message was already written in, but hadn't been sent. It said, I am in danger, all lowercase. My phone automatically autocorrects I'm lowercase to I'm with an uppercase. So I was really confused. It's possible, maybe, that a water droplet from my dish gloves flung onto the phone when I reached it, but I don't think it could type a whole message. After I checked on my husband, I called my mom and texted my brother. Everyone was fine. About a half hour later, when I went back to the kitchen, I was momentarily overcome with nausea and felt sweaty, but it passed after a few minutes. I have no idea what that was. I didn't feel like I was the one in danger. Maybe just a strange, unexplainable glitch and the nausea was unrelated? Or it was a message from someone, but I can't think of who it would be. I scanned my phone for viruses and malware and I didn't find any. I don't know anyone personally who would want to hack my phone. I'm basically a hermit. I have agoraphobia and I work out of my house. I haven't received any weird texts and I don't have any apps that I didn't download myself. It's still possible, I guess, but it doesn't look like my phone was hacked and I don't have any other explanation. When I was younger, in about the fourth grade, I lived in Germany. My father was in the military, 
so we lived on the military base, and that is where I met my best friend at the time. Let's just call her MK. MK and I's parents noticed that we would always play together and we would have playdates. Eventually, MK and I brought our families together and we would all hang out. MK had two older sisters and a little brother, while I have an older and a younger brother. MK and her family lived off base in the local part of Germany, so they lived amongst the non-English speaking, well, German people. Of course, the house MK lived in was old, really old. I would stay the night over there all the time. One night, for some reason that I can't remember, MK and I decided to sleep on the floor in the bedroom that she shared with the second oldest sister. Let's call her B. B was in the room with the oldest sister and let MK and I have the other bedroom to ourselves. So anyway, this night we're sleeping on the floor a few feet away from their beds. I remember waking up in the middle of the night to the only light coming from the hallway. The door was open. My vision was blurry and kind of kept going in and out. I remember looking up at MK's bed, and on it there sat a woman. I knew she was from the older times because she wore all black, and she had one of those bulky dresses and a black veil over her face. The way she was sitting, her peripheral vision would have been toward me. She sat up straight, both legs together, hands in her lap, as though she was in church. I guess she felt me look at her because she slowly started turning her head toward me. I remember at that moment that I wasn't scared, but everything felt sad. The energy was sad, her face looked sad. She already looked as if she was at a funeral. Anyway, as soon as her face got all the way around to look at me, my vision went black and the next thing I remember is waking up in the morning. I told MK and her sister about it, but I think they didn't want to believe me. I also think, though, that something told them I wasn't joking. I went back over there a few more times because that woman, although creepy, didn't make me feel unsafe. And to this day, I've always wondered what her story was. was a kid when I was a kid in the 90s I would often sleep at my grandmother's house in the middle of a small village in the Jura region of France the bedroom I would stay in was called the room in the back as the name suggests it was one of the last two rooms at the end of a main corridor shaped like an L there wasn't anything special about that bedroom it was pretty small and contained a bed shelves with books and some other very basic furniture Yet, for some reason, that room creeped me out. I felt an unwelcoming presence, and I would always struggle to fall asleep, scared of whatever invisible forces seemed to be lurking in the dark. One night there, when I was around eight years old, I woke up scared and confused. I found myself lying down on the floor and in total darkness. I feel like I need to make two things clear here. This is the only time in my entire life that I have ever awakened outside of whatever bed or couch I'd been sleeping in. Second, despite the fact that the house is located in a small village, it wasn't particularly isolated, and the street lights outside would always let a little bit of light filter through the closed blinds at night. So here I was, a child, surrounded by total obscurity, struggling to understand why I wasn't in my bed, I tried my best to stay calm and touched around me, hoping to find the side of the bed nearby so I could climb back into it, but I simply could not find it. I tried for several minutes, but it just didn't seem to be there, which was extremely strange considering that the bedroom wasn't that big in the first place. I therefore decided to move forward in a single direction to find a wall, and then I could follow that wall until I found the bed. 
but things got even stranger as I tried to find a wall. I would bump into furniture that I didn't recognize, and despite all of my efforts, I could not find a wall anywhere. Everything around me was completely and utterly unfamiliar. I thought about calling for help. My grandmother was sleeping in the bedroom on the other side of the corridor, and my parents in the living room. However, I imagined them finding me screaming on the floor and decided not to, not wanting to face that kind of embarrassment. Finally, I fell asleep on the floor, giving up on finding the bed. The next morning, I woke up in that bed under the blankets. It was like the entire event had been nothing more than a weird dream, yet it absolutely did not feel like a dream. I am a natural lucid dreamer, and even back then, I was already very familiar with how dreams feel, and this just wasn't one. A few years ago, a long time after this strange occurrence, I went to England to visit my aunt, who's from the other side of the family. She claims to be a witch and is into a lot of new age stuff. I've always been skeptical, but I have to admit that she's done and said a few strange things that got me to go from not believing her at all to being a little bit more neutral about it. We were talking about our respective families, and she went on about the only time when she had ever been to my grandma's house when I was a baby. I thought it was a good opportunity to see if she had sensed anything unusual there, and I asked her, making sure to keep the question open so as not to influence her. The first thing she said was, ah, yes, the room in the back. She said it in English and had no idea that we called it that way in French too. There is something wrong with that room, she said. I was spooked. Once I got back to France, I decided to confront my mother about it, since she'd spent her childhood in that house. As soon as I asked her what was wrong with that room in the back, she froze and her face became white. She explained to me that when she was little, she went into that bedroom with a few friends and they tried to invoke spirits for fun. They sat down on the floor in a circle, holding hands, and said, Spirit, if you're here, knock three times. They immediately heard three very violent knocks and ran off, screaming. She told me that ever since then, the room had felt weird. That's it. Nowadays, the room is pretty different, but still used as a guest bedroom. It still feels weird, but I'd say a lot less so than when I was a kid. I know my brothers, who are 10 years younger than I am, have also complained about feeling uncomfortable there for some reason, but they never had any unusual experience there. Just a feeling. I remember when I was a kid that every school was built over a cemetery. It was cliche. But my elementary school actually was built over one. Ever since I was a little girl, I was heavily interested in the paranormal, and I always thought my school had something weird going on. For some reason, I was invested in proving to myself that I was right. In the fourth grade, my experiments began. I purposefully stayed later in my classroom, hoping something would happen. I was always alone for like 10 minutes every day in the classroom, and I waited for like five minutes in silence to hear something. I was slowly getting frustrated and decided to drop my experiments. But one day, it happened. I was alone in my classroom, putting some things away in my locker space as quickly as possible so I could join my friends on the patio. My classroom was at the end of the hallway on the second floor, so I was rushing to catch up. I could hear the muffled voices of the other kids outside. In one instant, it was like a crowd of people talking out loud just hit me in the ears. I couldn't understand a bit of what they were saying, but it was loud, louder than a bunch of kids playing outside. I grabbed my backpack and ran outside. When I was just by the stairs, I closed my backpack and walked to meet my friends. I was freaked out, but I didn't say anything to anybody. I didn't want a bunch of other kids to stay late in the classroom with me, 
and if someone told a teacher, they would think I was doing it for attention. Some weeks passed and I wasn't staying late anymore because I didn't want to hear those voices again. One day, I thought it would be interesting to leave a piece of paper with a message for the ghosts hidden behind my books. I made sure nobody was there and that nobody could see it in plain sight. Sure enough, I received answers written on the paper. They were simple sentences, yes or no answers. Since my mom was a teacher at my school, I was the first kid to arrive at the classroom before anybody else would come in. I would open my message and I would see the answer. Eventually I stopped doing that because something about it just felt wrong and I could tell that the ghosts or whatever they were were getting a bit annoyed. It wasn't much, but it was enough that it made me believe in ghosts and made me think that I was as awesome as the ghost hunters on TV. Back in October of 1989, my mother and I went up to the western part of North Carolina for a week to see the leaves change color. We rented a cabin which was owned by the cousin of my brother's former high school band teacher who had retired several years earlier. The band director was more or less keeping watch over the place. He lived down the street, but it wasn't until Friday afternoon that we saw him. The cabin was somewhat in the wilderness, but it was near a main road. The band director had to go away for the weekend and was letting us know. We had the number of his cousin in case we needed any help. That was on a Friday afternoon. Up until that time, the trip had been uneventful. Friday evening, we went to a church dinner, which was down the road. When we came back home, it was already dark. My mom started thinking that we were the only ones on this road and that we didn't know where the nearest neighbor was and that was unsettling to her. The moon wasn't full, but there was a light to it. We had separate rooms inside the cabin. The power went out in the cabin shortly after we came home from the church dinner. Then my mother heard what sounded like footsteps and she saw what looked like an outline of a hat through the window there was a man walking around near the cabin. Then we saw this hat disappear into the woods. By this time, both of us were together and terrified. We thought that this man was going to come into the cabin and harm us. Both of us wondered if he had cut the power source. I decided to sleep in the bed that was in my mother's room. We tried to sleep and then were awakened by an owl hooting. My mom could see the owl's eyes, which were looking into the window. The drape couldn't be closed the entire way. The owl didn't take its eyes off my mom the entire night, and it hooted all night long too. My mother tried to ignore the owl, but its presence really unnerved her. The eyes really unnerved me. Neither of us could sleep. Every noise jarred us awake. It would be like, what's that? Did you hear that? Every once in a while, we would see the outline of that hat walking around the general area, and then it would go off into the woods. Both of us were freaked out by this point, but we also weren't about to leave in the middle of the night. There was no phone in the cabin, and this was long before cell phones were common. The power finally did come back on several hours later, or so it seemed. We were in the wee hours of the morning at that point. Originally, we were going to leave on Sunday, but we left as soon as the sun came up on Saturday. A couple of days later, my mother got a call from the band director. Apparently, the man that we had seen was a mountain man who was a handyman who had been trying to get the power back on for us. He was harmless, but neither the band director or his cousin had told us that he lived out in the woods. Had we known this, we wouldn't have left on Saturday. He was the one that had told the band director that we left a day early. We can laugh about it now. It was a memorable night. That owl still freaks me out, though.
I started going to a new school in the second grade. The cafeteria was downstairs in the basement, and then there was a long, empty hallway that led to the two bathrooms. I remember the first time I went to the bathroom there. Nobody told me it was haunted, so on the first day of second grade, I ventured down the hall to go to the bathroom. As I made my way toward it, I kept hearing this noise. It was like, ooh, ooh, over and over. When I approached the doorway, so much negative energy hit me that I knew not to go in there. I ran back to the cafeteria, told some girls about it, and they were like, oh yeah, it's haunted. We were all terrified of this bathroom. The boys said that their bathroom was fine, but that the girls' bathroom down there also freaked them out, even to be near it. It got so bad that we had to have the principal come and talk to our class about it. Everyone knew it was haunted. Flash forward to third grade. It was Halloween, and I was the first student in the classroom. Every Halloween, we had a parade outside where we would all march around in our costumes. I began putting my costume on over my clothes and I noticed a piece of paper folded up on my desk. It caught my eye. I don't know how to describe it, but it was folded strangely. I picked it up, unfolded it, and in a faint handwriting was, if you dare go to the bathrooms downstairs, I'll kill you. I can't make this up. I was the first student in the classroom. The previous day, I had left school in line with everyone else. Once more kids came into the classroom, I told my friends and they were more scared than I was. They made me tell the teacher. You could tell that she thought it was odd, but she crumpled up the paper and threw it away. And that's the last time I saw it. I went in the bathroom again, but only in large groups. We used to have a thing called field day where we played outside all day at the end of the school year. One day on a field day, about 10 other girls and I had to go to the bathroom. So we all teamed up and went to the one downstairs. I remember leaning up against the wall and feeling and hearing something. It was like somebody was banging on the wall with an ax. We all heard it and it was uncomfortably loud. I also have to add that no one ever went into the last stall, but this day a girl did. I mean, it had cobwebs all over it and everything. Literally nobody would use it. Then one night I was at the school for a concert. This was toward the end of fifth grade, so I was brave enough to go there by myself. I was kind of curious. I went down to the hall and as usual, that whoa, sound could be heard a mile away. I went into the bathroom, but I just kind of stood around. I didn't actually go into a stall or anything. Suddenly, I just got scared and I ran toward the door, but I was rather surprised when I bumped into a strange lady with long gray hair, a scarf partially covering her head and face. I just brushed by her and ran. Also, the lights have turned off when I was in that bathroom. The energy in there is just insane. You just feel in danger. Girls would cry and sob because they didn't want to have to use that bathroom. The loud, overwhelming sound and the occasional banging noises, that unused last stall, the scratches on the mirror, the old poster on the wall, all of it was just creepy. That note might have been a prank, but that bathroom is haunted. Here's a bit of background. I'm from Texas and my boyfriend is from Maine. We both live in Texas now in a decently sized city outside of Dallas. But during the summer, we attempt to escape the heat and visit his family in Maine for a few weeks. I've had my fair share of experiences growing up in a haunted house. So I was raised as a believer. Weird things seem to happen frequently but I don't like to automatically attribute it to a ghost or whatever. 
I like to think that I'm a fairly logical person, and I like to try to debunk weird things. That being said, my boyfriend is pretty skeptical and doesn't spook easily, so that makes this story even more interesting. Around 11 p.m. one night, he and I were sitting on his dad's front porch and we were just chit-chatting. The porch is raised and looks down over a backyard that runs to the tree line at the edge of thick woods. We were just hanging out, completely sober, I might add, when we heard what sounded like an adolescent boy singing scales. It was just your typical la 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 la. It was just background noise, and honestly, we were used to living in an apartment so much in the city that we didn't really think anything of it. In fact, we were annoyed. My boyfriend actually said, do you think he knows we're here? That could be awkward. I laughed, and then I realized what we were listening to. We were hearing what sounded like a boy in the woods late at night walking back and forth in the dark woods singing scales over and over. My boyfriend was still bent on the idea that he should give the guy some warning that he had an audience. So he sang a tune of scales back to him. La 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 la. The same scale came loudly right from the trees. It sounded like whoever it was was instantly standing right at the tree line beside us. It was loud, and it seemed that whoever, or whatever it was, had instantly covered a huge amount of distance to go from somewhere off in the woods to just a few feet away from us. We both instantly had that fight or flight response, and without thinking or talking about it, we both jumped up as if we were going to run into the house. Something felt weird. We had flipped a switch from harmless, awkward fun to terrified. There's a house back there, right? I asked my boyfriend. There has to be, he said back. We were spooked and we went into the house anyway. We both couldn't stop thinking about it and suddenly the details began to sink in about just how weird this actually was. First, if that was an actual person, we would have heard them stomping around in the woods. The song sounded as if they were pacing back and forth over an area of about 20 feet, and the woods were thick. You couldn't walk through them without cracking leaves and twigs. Second, there were no lights through the trees. If that actually was a 12 or 13 year old boy, unless he has night vision or something, he would have needed a flashlight to accompany him, especially if he was taking careful steps so as not to make a sound. If there was a flashlight, we would have seen it through the darkness. Third, how did he instantly cover that much space to get right beside us at the tree line? I know that voices can be carried on the wind, but there was no wind that night. It also sounded enough like a real person not a floating voice on the wind, that we both automatically assumed there was an actual boy out there. Lastly, we asked his dad where in the woods his neighbor's house was. He just looked at us and said, I don't have neighbors. There's no house back there for miles. People in Maine don't tend to have close neighbors, but the next day we went back and checked anywhere and there was no sign of people anywhere. So, I just want to start out by saying that I'm some ways a skeptic. I generally call myself agnostic when it comes to not just religion, but anything supernatural or paranormal. For me, this means that I've vacillated at different points in my life all over the spectrum of belief, from times where I basically was willing to believe in anything, to being about as hardcore of a skeptic as you can get. These days, I'm in a weird place somewhere in between. I still feel like I live in the mundane material world, but there's something so much bigger and weird peeking right over the horizon. 
The main thing that keeps me from having a 100% skeptical outlook is that I've had my share of very weird experiences. Not as weird as some people's, but weird enough that they have me questioning what is real. I should note that I'm not the most mentally stable person, so some of it can be chalked up to that. And at times, thinking I'm just crazy is actually the most comfortable option. But also, I've had plenty of experiences that I have shared with others as well, and those are a lot harder to dismiss. I know shared delusions or hallucinations are possible, but they're exceedingly rare from my understanding. And mostly limited to just two people who are extremely close, like siblings or spouses. Some of my experiences have been backed up by as many as four witnesses. This is one such experience. A number of years back, I acquired a house through my family. I won't bore you with the details, but it was through some pretty weird and convoluted circumstances. The house itself is very strange looking inside. I'd best describe it as something out of Alice in Wonderland meets Black Lodge from Twin Peaks. Lots of weird angles, oddly sized rooms with no clear purpose, and decorating that looked like it came from someone who had only read about humans in a book. More spiritually oriented folks who visit would variously claim that it had a vaguely sinister or dark feel to it, while others would say it had a light and inviting energy. I'm not sure I put much stock in any of that, but I suppose it's worth noting. The really weird stuff started early on. Within the first couple of months, my housemate and I kept finding weird bits of writing all over the place. First, it was seemingly just names, all kinds of random personal names. Although the handwriting was neat, we figured it must have come from the kids of the family who lived there before us. But maybe it's worth noting that most of it probably wasn't them. At least they weren't writing their own names, as the family that had lived there spoke Spanish. Most of these were decidedly not family names of theirs. For instance, there were names like Gertrude and Siobhan, and we know that they don't have any of those in their family. We found about 15 of these names, at least, and only seven people lived in the house before us. So, even by that count, some of them couldn't have been theirs. I suppose it's possible that the kids might have just been scrawling random names that they knew for some reason. But then we started finding other stuff, like whole sentences tucked away under countertops or on baseboards, and eventually, even on our furniture, stuff that wasn't even in the house before we got there. The sentences were never really threatening or anything. They were just strange and mostly nonsensical. Sometimes they looked like song lyrics, but they never came up as anything when I tried to Google them. Also, to be clear, the fact that we kept finding these random scrawlings made zero sense, because sometimes we would swear that they had shown up in places we'd already looked before, almost like more of them were being made, and yet they all looked very similar in handwriting. A little wavy and childlike, but overall neat, neutral, and legible. This was starting to feel more and more like the beginning of some stereotypical horror movie, but it still wasn't weird enough to really freak us out, yet. We also had lots of stuff go missing, usually only to turn up later in really strange places that we were sure neither of us had left it. But again, nothing too out there. There were some minor poltergeist-like activity early on too, objects that seemed to jump off of fixtures on their own. There were pretty consistent electrical issues as well, including a microwave that we had to keep unplugged because it had this habit of turning itself on. But probably just faulty wiring in an old house, right? No. You see, things really began to ramp up about a year after we moved in. I had gone on a road trip for about a week, and I didn't get back until nearly 4 a.m. When I did, I was greeted by a strange little nest of dried grass with three roughly equally sized but differently colored stones sitting in front of my front door. This was weird, 
but I assumed it was something one of my roommates had put there for some reason or another, and I didn't think too far into it. The friend that I had been traveling with noticed it too when she was helping with bags, and found it odd, but just like me, didn't think much of it. So the next day, I casually asked my housemates what was up with the little bed of grass and the rocks, and they were all confused. Each of them had assumed that I had put it there. At this point, I assumed either my roommates or a friend of mine was playing a prank on me. A really strange prank, but a prank nonetheless. With this assumption, I did the whole, okay, nice one, you got me, assuming that at least one of them would confess to their not so clever prank. But all of them insisted earnestly that they had no part in it, and they continued to insist this for the rest of the time that I knew them. I'm inclined to believe them, as none were really the pranking type. They would definitely have admitted it under duress. After all, it was about as harmless a prank as you could get. Any of my friends that I confronted said the same exact thing and never let up. Really the only friend I could easily imagine coming up with such an odd, abstract prank was the one that I had been on a road trip with, so there was no way she had done it. I am absolutely certain that it was not there when I left, and all of my roommates said that it wasn't even there the day before I got back. So really, that just left the possibility of it being the work of some random prankster in the neighborhood. But there are problems with that too, such as the fact that these stones got moved and put back exactly the same way on multiple occasions, until the whole thing creeped me out enough that I finally took them inside. This did stop them from being put back again and again, but maybe it was a mistake if you believe that they were perhaps tied to something. Who knows, I guess. On top of that, I asked our incredibly nosy next door neighbor about it once, like if she'd seen anybody on our porch. She said no, but she'd keep an eye out. To be clear, she was retired and kept an eye on things at all hours that she was awake. And she was a light sleeper. So this prankster would have to be continually coming back in the middle of the night to set these rocks up, with cat burglar-like stealth over and over again, immediately after they were disturbed. Unlikely. But it gets even weirder. The poltergeist-type activity ramped up, and eventually it led to stuff like the bathtub turning itself on in the middle of the night when I was the only one home. I have no history of sleepwalking or anything like that. Then, both me and at least one of the other roommates started getting woken up in the night by mice. Except both of us swear by all things holy that when we occasionally caught glimpses of these critters, they were weird. Like really weird. They were incredibly pale, hairless, bipedal, and tailless. But granted, we only ever caught brief glimpses of them because they were incredibly fast faster than typical mice, and seemed to make great effort to stay out of the light or out of the open. We also both suffered strange, vivid nightmares and heard voices, and while for me this wasn't completely unusual and could even be chalked up to mental illness, my roommate had no history of anything more severe than depression, had never taken any substances beyond weed and alcohol and was hardly into those, and was completely sober during these experiences. Yet, she apparently suffered so much from them that she eventually moved out. There was some other stuff, like the house getting a lock mysteriously put on it by a property firm who didn't own it. Like I said, my family owned it. Nobody at the property company had any knowledge of who might have done it, and whoever did it apparently did so in the dead of night. Because, again, my neighbors hadn't seen anybody do it while they were awake. Maybe it was just professional incompetence. Who knows? Other things started showing up on our porch over time, like bundles of twigs and a sprouting sweet potato, rotting fruit. I'm reasonably sure that it was not the work of anyone I knew. And after all of that, my neighbors surely would have seen at least one of these instances. Anyhow, I no longer live at this house, but I've been thinking about all the odd experiences that I had there lately. And while they're maybe not the weirdest or hardest to explain, 
They always struck me as both oddly personal somehow, as well as oddly senseless. The only reason that I've ever thought they could be the fey folk or fairies isn't because of the conclusion that I personally came to, but because I spoke to a friend of mine who's way more into esoterica and paranormal stuff than I am. She immediately assumed it was old school trickster fairies. This friend did have a bit of a personal connection to the whole fey realm. She actually claimed to have been abducted by them when she was little, but that whole thing is not my story to tell and we don't have time. I will say though, although this girl held some metaphysical beliefs that I'm not quite on board with, she never struck me as an out and out liar. She certainly experienced something strange and traumatic when she was young and never even wanted to talk about it with most people. Still, she was right about the fact that certain aspects of the whole thing really do seem to evoke the weird and fickle nature of mythological fae. Maybe we even glimpsed them, but who knows? Anyway, if you have any idea as to what this could have been, or if you agree that it was the fae, let me know. I'd love to hear some ideas. To this day, it was just the most bizarre experience and I've never come up with a good explanation. For about two months, weird things have been happening. I've been living in this house since 2000 now. My parents built it only 22 years old. I'm from Bavaria, Germany. About one month ago, while I was laying in bed at about midnight, I heard knocking coming from the hallway ceiling. It knocked twice, and it sounded like there was a lot of force behind it, because the ceiling made crackling sounds. A few days later, I was laying in bed, and I was nearly asleep. Suddenly, I heard a childlike voice whispering behind me. They were whispering, Stimmt, Stimmt. It's a German word for right, all right, or I agree. I was super scared, but I didn't dare turn around. Last night, I was woken up by three loud knocks. A few seconds later, the same three knocks came again, just a little bit more silent and gentle. At first, I was kind of half asleep and half dreaming. But suddenly I realized this knocking was not from my dream, but it was from above me, maybe in the attic. And suddenly I was 100% awake and scared. My heart was beating out of my chest. I lay there for about 10 minutes without moving. I looked at my phone to see what time it was, 2.57 AM. I couldn't sleep for two hours but I didn't hear anything else. All the knocks that I heard so far cannot be wind or water pipes. They really do sound human. I have no idea what this could be. My wife and I bought our house almost three years ago. The very first night while we were there, we were laying in bed about to fall asleep when we heard a loud knock on the kitchen floor. It was like something very heavy had fallen. We jumped out of bed to find nothing. We hadn't even unpacked anything. Over the next few weeks, we would hear the doors in our basement open and shut. Several times I would get up and go down to the basement to see if anything was out of the ordinary, but nothing would ever be out of place. We have a completely finished basement and it's not creepy or anything like that. Over time, activity would mellow out and then ramp back up again. My wife and I would both, on occasion, catch somebody standing in the kitchen as we walked by the kitchen door. But when we did a double take, nobody would be there. Most of the activities that we experience take place during the day, so I don't think it's just us being spooked by the dark or something. My children have had many strange occurrences too. 
I was in the kitchen one day, and my son was sitting on the stairs to the basement. He jumped up and ran to me, saying, the bad man's in the basement. I asked, where? And he replied, at the bottom of the stairs. Being a rational adult and not wanting our three-year-old to be afraid, I decided to walk him down and show him that there was nothing to be afraid of. We found no one. A couple of weeks later, while I was at work, my wife and kids were home alone. My wife was in the bedroom and my son in the living room playing trains. All of a sudden, my kid screams and runs into my wife shouting, the bad daddy is in the kitchen. My wife looked, but nobody was there. Sometime later, my wife and kids and I were in the living room watching TV while the kids played. Both my son and daughter stop at the exact same time, look at the kitchen, and follow something there with their eyes down the hall into a bedroom, back down the hall and through the kitchen. We were sitting there watching both of them track the same thing that we couldn't see. Another time, the four of us were in the kitchen planting seeds for our garden in the little seed starter trays, when our daughter stops and looked at the doorway to the basement. She smiled and said, are you playing in the basement? She was two at the time and spoke clear as day to somebody that we could not see. Other times we would hear our kids talk to somebody when they were in their rooms completely alone. One Sunday morning while watching football, I was sitting on the couch with my back to the bedroom door, which was open. I decided to get up and make some breakfast. The door was open when I walked into the kitchen. When I came back, the door was closed. I thought it was odd, but I just sat back down and continued to watch the game. After a while, I got back up to go to the bathroom, and I noticed that the door was opened halfway. When I returned to the living room, it was shut again. The rest of the day, I sat in the chair adjacent to the couch so that I could have a full view of the door. We've had many strange encounters. These are just the few that I can think of off the top of my head. The activity seems to be picking up again, and my wife wants to sage again. I try to be rational and remind her that this is a 70-year-old house. There will be noises. But as a skeptic, I find it hard to be skeptical with the amount of activity we have here. This story happened a few years ago. I lived in a building with my daughter, who grew attached to my neighbor's husband, Teddy, as if he were her dad. One day, while talking with my neighbor's wife, my daughter, who was two and a half years old at this time, came running to the door. But rather than running into my neighbor's apartment to go cuddle up Teddy, she froze at the doorway. She told his wife and I that we needed to be quiet, as Teddy was sleeping. Teddy was not sleeping. He was, in fact, sitting on the couch watching TV. Teddy stood up and called for my daughter to come see him. Again, my daughter looked at his wife and I and told us that Teddy was sleeping and that we needed to be quiet. I could see she was getting upset at the fact that we were laughing while telling her that Teddy was awake and wants you to go sit with him. Teddy started approaching the doorway where we were standing my daughter began to cry and ran into our apartment screaming, no, Teddy is sleeping. I could feel the goosebumps running across my body. That same day, my daughter went to a relative's place for a sleepover. I had invited my neighbors to come over for a bit and Teddy came over and explained that he wasn't feeling the best. He said that he was breathing in and out of a paper bag before coming to my apartment. I insisted he go to the hospital to make sure he was all right. On the way, Teddy fell ill and asked to pull over so he could be sick at the side of the road. As he was kneeling beside the car, Teddy suffered a major heart attack and passed away while on the way to the hospital. When the service was held for Teddy, I had such a strong feeling that I had to bring my daughter with me. She brought her favorite blanket with her, of course. 
When my daughter and I got to the funeral home for the viewing, we were greeted by everyone in Teddy's family. They all knew who my daughter was, as Teddy used to talk about her all the time. I held my daughter close as we walked up to the casket where Teddy laid. My daughter leaned down, almost as if she was going to whisper to him. She then told me, See, Teddy is sleeping, and he's really cold. She took her blanket and tucked Teddy in, then looked at me and said how he was warm and happy now. That night, as I sat alone in the living room, my phone began to ring. Four or five rings later and still no name appeared. I quickly answered the phone in the middle of a ring, only to hear the dial tone. The call didn't even show up as an incoming call afterwards. It felt like Teddy had called us to say goodbye. It was so strange that my daughter knew there was something wrong with Teddy before anything even happened. A few months later, we went to go visit my grandmother, who was passing away from pancreatic cancer. My daughter refused to enter my grandmother's room. She kept saying how my grandmother was sleeping and that everyone should leave her alone to go sleep. I instantly began to cry. Only four days later, I got the call that my grandmother had passed away in her sleep. When I was six or seven, we moved out to a ranch in the countryside of Laredo, Texas. Not a lot of people with good income lived out here. Most houses were isolated and surrounded by woods. My mom and stepdad decided to rent this house because the rent was cheap, only $3.50 a month. No indoor plumbing or central air. A lot of low-income families lived out there. There was a family that lived next to us, a family of six kids, all girls, and two adults. They were also low income and often didn't have much to eat. My mom would often help them out with food. In return, the kids would come over and help my mom clean the house. This one day, they came over and ate dinner with us, helped my mom clean, and the youngest girl and I that was about my age fell asleep on my bed. After a while, my mom woke us up because it was getting late and she needed her to go home. Her sisters had left her behind because they didn't want to wake her. It was a good walk to her home, as there was a dirt road leading to our house to get to hers. My mom was going to send my brother to walk with her, but I butted in and said, can't I walk her? We're friends. My mom said yes, so I walked her to the gate. We departed and I started on my way home. Out of nowhere, she comes running behind me, crying, and throws herself at me and pulls me down by the shoulders. I asked her what was wrong, what had happened. She points up and says, look, look up there. She was pointing up at the top of some abandoned train cars. And to this day, I can't explain what we saw. There were three skeletons walking back and forth. I was like, what the heck? One was laying on its side and it had clothes on too, like a tank top and shorts. The other two were standing up, just walking back and forth behind that one, stopping and waving high. We looked at each other and ran to my house. I quickly told my mom what we saw. My mom and two brothers plus us went back to look and they were still there, just waving high at us. We threw rocks at them, but it didn't even phase them. It just went through them. Either that or we were bad at aiming. After a while, we went home and never saw them again. Till this day, I can't seem to understand or be able to explain how those skeletons were moving. Some will probably say that we were hallucinating, but how can five people see the same thing? Some have said it was Halloween props, but it was the 90s and I had never seen any Halloween props that moved that well during that time. The technology just wasn't there. Plus, Halloween props like that would have cost a lot of money, and that family couldn't even afford to eat. We were in a dirt poor area of the country. There's no way anybody had animatronic skeletons.
This happened sometime near the end of seventh grade. My aunt, my brother, my cousin, and I were all visiting our grandparents' house in Washington State. They lived in a pretty remote area with only a handful of other houses around and a good chunk of forest between each of them. Keep in mind that it's also kind of an island, so they don't get many funky creatures out there. My aunt and I went out while it was still dark outside, just walking the path in the forest and trying to figure out what was making this loud sound. It wasn't necessarily a weird one. It sounded like a normal forest noise. I said frogs, she said crickets. I was right. Anyway, we pass this pond area and we make our way to a clearing. I don't know if this is entirely relevant, but the clearing was a bit small with an apple tree in the middle. That's where my brother and cousin and I would hang out whenever we were outside. Whenever we reached the clearing, I immediately started to get a bad feeling. I figured, you know, it's dark. I'm typically terrified of the dark and I'm tired. It's just me. Nothing is really going to happen. The path was a bit overgrown around there, so we decided to turn back. Right before we did, though, I caught a glimpse of what could have been a really big owl up in one of the trees, just staring at us. Now, I'm an Arizona girl, so I don't know what creatures are normal in the forest, but this thing just didn't feel right to me. It just, like, gave me this weird vibe. My aunt kept walking and I caught up. Keep in mind, the path was pretty short and it only takes about 10 minutes or so to get to the clearing and a 10 minute walk back. But when we got closer to the house, we heard my grandma yelling for us. We run back to the house to see what's wrong and she says we've been gone for hours. We swear we'd only been out for at most a half an hour. And when my brother and cousin come back, they tell us that they had been out searching for us, worried sick. We check the time, and they were right. Another interesting thing that could be connected, a few days before that, we had heard some really weird noises coming from the woods when we were out making s'mores. Even my grandparents, who have lived there longer than I've been alive, admitted that it was unlike anything they had ever heard before. It kept getting closer and closer and stopped any time somebody tried to get a video of it or capture it on recording. Eventually, I had to go inside because it was freaking me out so badly. I'm sure that everything in this story could be explained, but the time loss thing still gets to me. This happened to me when I was in the fourth grade. I moved into a new school. Someone once said to me that the stairs in that school were haunted. The story goes that one day some students were going down the stairs when they got pushed. A teacher just walked by and asked, what happened? Who pushed you? And at that exact moment, the teacher herself got pushed. Another story goes that this particular ghost was running around the hallway during assembly. Also, this ghost apparently had no arms or legs. I asked other people if this was true, and they said that it was. So I got curious, and I decided to check it out with one of my friends at break. So to get to this supposedly haunted staircase, you had to go through a door. In front of that door is another door. Open that door, and the stairs are right there. My friends and I opened the first door, and were about to open the second. But then I saw something, a shadowy figure that seemed to have no arms. My friend saw it too, so we ran out the back door to the playground. Now you might say that it could have just been a shadow of someone else, but the figure was standing right in the middle of the stairs, not against a wall or anything like that. I never used those stairs again, unless I was walking with a teacher or a group of people. To this day, I still wonder if I imagined it or if that thing was really there.
When I was pregnant, my kid's father and I stayed at his cousin's house for about a month before we moved into our apartment. It's an old farmhouse in a newly developed area of Warwick, Rhode Island. There are farms and woods in one direction and a small town in the other. We were told when we moved in that the house had been built in the mid 1800s, which to me was super interesting until my kid's father, let's call him Brian, remarked at how the stairs seemed awfully dark and creepy for the middle of the day. And when I looked, he was right. Gave off such a sinister vibe. We slept in the living room at night and could see through the kitchen. And it was as if the stairs became a dark, uncomfortable void. When we brought this up to Brian's cousin and his wife, they proceeded to laugh and tell us stories of people being pushed down the stairs. I don't think they believed in ghosts, and the husband was an abusive drunk, so they had a lot of problems going on. That house was chaotic. The husband and wife clearly were having some serious issues, emotionally and financially. They had a six-year-old son who was afraid to sleep upstairs by himself because the shadows scared him. Great. After being in the house alone a couple of times, I saw genuine human figures out of the corner of my eye. Even better, black dots on the floor with what looked like long spindly legs would run around, but whenever you would look at them straight on, they would disappear. A few times I would see a figure out of the corner of my eye. I would go to look and see one of the family members who I hadn't heard come in. I think that freaked me out the most because how can you explain to yourself seeing a person and sometimes nothing being there, but other times you expect it to disappear, but that time it would in fact be a person standing there. It was so weird. Brian would say how sitting in one chair in the living room, you'd want to look over your shoulder into the doorway as if somebody was coming down a set of stairs that used to be there. This also freaked me out considering I slept right near the doorway and often would get a feeling of somebody coming toward me. One day, Brian and I were the only two in the entire house. Facing one another about two feet away, face to face, talking loudly as we usually do, we hear directly in the middle of us, a woman's voice say, shh, I asked if he had said that, and he stared at me with huge eyes and asked, no, didn't you? Then we laughed it off because clearly we were talking too loud for the inhabitants, apparently. We eventually brought this up to the family, who included a second cousin living upstairs, and they confirmed that they too saw and felt things. They told us they assumed the black voids that ran on the floors were just one of their dogs and ignored it if it wasn't. The cousin who lived upstairs said that the curtains to his closet often moved as though they were being pushed aside, but he had chalked it up to just being tired. There was no breeze. The wife told me that when they first moved in there, her son would see a man in a hat, but she had always assumed that it was just his imagination. I mean, how could you live in a house so clearly haunted and just pass it off? I'll never get it. The front of the house at night was avoided by basically everybody, as it was right where it felt like somebody was walking by the door frame. It felt like the person was coming right at you into the living room. One night, I didn't feel like walking all the way around this huge house to the car, so I walked as fast as I could to the car through the front door. I heard a deep growling coming from the side of the house. They owned three dogs, one of which was a bull mastiff. Too freaked out to call for her, I ran in and to my horror, all three dogs were in the house. Needless to say, I didn't use that entrance again. It was such an emotionally depressing house and maybe me being pregnant, I was just more aware of everything. There were other weird things, but one of the last conversations I had with one of the roommates renting a back bedroom was about Brian and I hearing that shh. She explained that she hears the exact same thing in the hallway if she and her son are getting a little loud. She was just sure it was the owner's young son sneaking into the hallway, but I'm not so sure.
We bought a house intending to use it as our second home, but after just a few months, we decided to sell it after some unusual experiences. Long story short, we're pretty sure it's haunted. Our real estate salesperson and the person who bought the home are both aware of the claims and have made an informed decision to purchase it anyway. They probably think I'm nuts. The home is not an old one. It was built in 2019 and we are the third owners. We've gotten an air quality test done in the home and both my husband and I have both received physical examinations. Nothing is out of the ordinary. We bought our winter home last year. Originally, we're from Canada, but we've spent the majority of the last couple of years between the United States and, more recently, Costa Rica. My first experience there was while I was taking a shower. The house has an ensuite washroom. When you enter the room, if you go to the left, you'll go toward the bathroom. If you go to the right, you'll end up in the bedroom. From the shower, you can see the entrance to the bedroom. One afternoon, while I was showering, I watched my husband walk into the bedroom with a glass of lemonade. I then turned around to wash the soap off my face and turned back toward the door to rinse the shampoo out of my hair. That's when I saw my husband enter the room again with the same glass of lemonade. When I exited the shower, I asked him if he had re-entered the room a couple of times, and he said no. He'd only ever come into the bedroom once and that he'd been there the majority of my shower. My husband had a similar experience. He was in the backyard looking into the kitchen. He claimed that he saw me leave the kitchen and walk toward the mudroom. He was very confused when he entered the house to find it empty. I had been out for a couple of hours. On multiple occasions, I've heard the sound of my husband's car scraping on the driveway. We have the steepest driveway on the block. And every time he parks the car, you can hear this distinct dragging sound of metal on the driveway. Whenever I hear this, I usually unlock the garage door. There have been multiple times where I've heard this sound, unlocked the door, and he isn't home. We've both heard whistling sounds that we can't explain, that stop once we acknowledge it. I guess it could just be the vents, but for the last three weeks, our thermostat hasn't been working, and we still hear it. There have been other trivial occurrences. Once I woke up in the middle of the night because the fridge door alarm was going off. We also have one of those annoying automatic toilets where the lid lifts when it detects motion. Well, those keep going off on their own too and opening up. I understand that with modern upgrades, there are going to be some malfunctions. So I put those experiences under the questionable category, but there have still been quite a lot of them. We've spent the past week packing our things. We're one of those people that just don't store anything in the garage other than our vehicles. The only other thing that we have in there is the water softener tank and that's it. So one night the car alarm goes off on both vehicles. Convinced that we're being robbed, we call the police and of course, the neighborhood security also comes by just to see that our cars are perfectly in the garage with no signs of an intruder. We officially moved out of that house three days before closing. We couldn't bear another day there. The neighbor texted me to ask what all the commotion was at our house. I told her that I had no idea what she was talking about because we don't even live there. I know this sounds insane, but we have lived in so many houses and we've never experienced anything like this. Even though our house was built in 2019, it was a teardown. There was another house on the same property that was built somewhere in the 60s, I think. So who knows what we might have inherited from that. I'm not a believer in the paranormal. And to be honest, I'm still very skeptical, but I'll share my experience anyway, because maybe it could provide some answers. I visited the Castle Museum in York, England. I specifically went there for a birthday trip, and me, being somebody who's obsessed with history, it was a no-brainer going there. The museum was fantastic, 
and I had a great time going through all the different floors and rooms it contained. About an hour in, we came across the prison section of the museum. Now this wasn't a huge prison, more like a dungeon than anything else. There were maybe about four cells on either side, all open for the public to wander inside and look around. Each cell was brightly lit enough to see where you were going, except for one. On the very far left side was a cell that had no lights, no furniture, no bed or tables or windows, nothing. It was pitch black and empty. So I decided that as a challenge, I would go inside and stay there for about 10 seconds. About five seconds in, I felt somebody go right up to my ear and whisper something. Unfortunately, I never made out what it said because I instantly panicked and ran out of the cell. Now my first thought afterward was maybe there was a speaker hidden inside the room, playing sounds to scare people. But unless the speaker was really just right next to my ear, I don't see how that was possible. My second thought was maybe a mischievous staff member or tourist decided to hide and scare us. But again, I would have had to have felt somebody leaning against me for how close it was in there. Sadly, I didn't ask a receptionist or anyone who worked there about that cell, or if there were any other reported experiences. I really wish I had. But I did do some research, and I found many stories and even some photographic evidence of paranormal encounters inside that prison section. So, either the darkness got to my head and I imagined it, or I am in fact another person to make contact with one of the restless souls who still wanders the museum. I was driving home from a big city near my little town late at night after a day there with this dude on our first date sometime in March of 2012. My date was asleep and his seat was reclined really low. We got into town at around 1 a.m. and I noticed this guy standing on the corner. I was about to stop at a red light and he was at the corner of that light. He looked like he was probably on something. He was talking to himself and pacing. I was a little nervous, but whatever. I'm a bit too quick to judge people sometimes. So I stopped and we accidentally made eye contact. At least, I accidentally did. I could tell that he was yelling at me because I kept hearing bitch and some other, uh, things as I was stopped at the longest red light ever. The guy I was with was sleeping cozily in the passenger seat, really, really reclined. After about 10 seconds of the guy cussing me out, he hopped over to my car and swings the passenger door open, reaching for me. I started screaming bloody murder and the guy I was on the date with woke up suddenly and started hitting the guy. I think it started as reflexes, but then it was actual hitting. The crazy guy is yelling, fuck man, didn't see you. Oh, oh, I didn't see you, this bitch. And things like that. My date pushed him out the door and I zoomed off, running the red light. He closed the door and just kept yelling, who the fuck was that? I'm hyperventilating and then I started half laughing and half crying because my nerves were just shot at that point. We got some ice cream at 1am and then I took him home and went home myself. We laughed about it later but I don't like to think about what would have happened if he hadn't been there. I'm a karaoke DJ. I usually get home between 2 and 3 a.m., but tonight I got off at around 11 because the bar had a power outage. I live alone in a triplex behind a house. I live in the middle of a city, but the property I'm on is rather large, so there's a big backyard behind my apartment. As I was coming home tonight, I noticed that my cats weren't waiting for me in the window. They can hear my van pulling in the driveway. They are in the window every night, no exception. I thought it was odd. 
Then I noticed that my kitchen light was on. I never leave my kitchen light on. At this point, I was a little freaked out. That's when I thought I saw movement in my kitchen. I called 911 and the dispatcher told me to lock my van doors and remain in the vehicle and to stay on the line. Officers showed up very quickly, less than five minutes. They parked on the street and walked up to my van. They asked me to stay quiet and to give them my house key. One officer went to the back of my apartment and the other used my key to unlock the door. When he opened the door, all was quiet. And then he yelled really loudly, telling someone to come out. I heard the police officer that was in my backyard start yelling and the other officer ran out to join him. My neighbors had come outside at this point and I was freaking out. It seemed like a long time, but they walked a cuffed woman toward me and it turns out it was a patron that I had 86 this last week. I have no idea how she found out where I lived. Apparently, she was hiding in my bedroom closet with a very large knife and a bundle of rope. I don't want to think about what would have happened if I had gone to bed with her waiting there for me. I was driving home from work at 2 a.m. I'm a nurse and I live in a small city. The roads were totally deserted and it was a freezing night. I don't live far from work, maybe a couple of miles. I'm driving down a residential street around the corner from my house and I see a man laying face down in the street. Now remember, I'm a nurse. My first thought was, great, gotta help this guy up. I was coming off a long shift and falls happen all the time. As I slowed down the car, I suddenly realized what an idiot move that was. I'm a 100 pound woman and I don't carry any weapons. I thought I should do something to help the guy. So I called 911 as I drove past him and slowed to a stop at the end of the block. While I was stopped at the light, I explained to the dispatcher that there was a man in the road who might need assistance. All of a sudden I hear a loud, bang, bang, from the driver's side window. I screamed and looked over. A man was pounding on my window and jiggling the handle of my locked car. I looked in the rearview mirror and saw that there was no man laying in the street. Still on the phone with 911, I screamed, I'm so scared, to the dispatcher and floored it through the red light. I quickly told him what had happened and even though I was right by my house, he told me to keep driving. After a few minutes, I had calmed down and he told me to loop back around. I pulled over down the road from my house and stayed in the car. I didn't see the man anywhere, so I got off the phone with the dispatcher who told me that he was sending a police car to cruise the area. As I gather up my things, I do a final scan of the area and I see the man. He is walking with two other men I hunched way down in my car until they were far down the road and then bolted into my house. I don't know if he had ill intent, but it freaks me the hell out that he wasn't alone. Always lock your car doors and maybe carry mace. My fiance and I rent a house together and we live alone. About two years ago, my fiance and I were lying in bed. It was actually pretty late in the morning, 10.30 or 11. I had been awake for about 10 or 15 minutes and my fiance was just waking up. We laid there talking softly about whether or not we should get up yet or if we should try to go back to sleep for a bit since he had the first half of the day off of work. Might be nice to catch up on sleep since we'd both had a busy couple of days. He was lying on his back, staring up at the ceiling, and I was on my right side facing him with my hand on his chest while we talked. In that position, I had my back to our bedroom door, which was maybe eight or nine feet away from the bed behind me. 
Suddenly an odd feeling came over the room. Seriously, it felt like the air in the room was either sucked out or made very, very heavy. And it almost felt like I was underwater, or gravity changed. The room seemed to almost feel like it was tilting to the side. It felt like the air in the room was pressing down on top of me, while at the same time slowing down time, making me dizzy and loopy. My ears were popping. Well, I thought it was just me feeling this, and for a moment, I wondered if I was having a blood pressure drop. I get those sometimes, though it still isn't quite like what I felt. But my fiancé said in a very frightened voice that sounded like he couldn't breathe very well, and like he couldn't get the words out without struggling, Do you feel that too? What's happening? And that was when I knew something odd and scary was going on, because he was feeling the exact same thing. I tried to speak, but my speech actually came out as a kind of slur. I had to force the words out of my mouth to say, I don't know. I can't move. He said, I can't either. I saw him trying to turn over onto his side and trying to raise his arm up. He just kept saying, what's happening? What's happening? I tried to raise my arm up too, and I found that I couldn't. Again, it was like being underwater, in an intensely pressurized room. I started trying to push myself up to see if I could sit up, but I couldn't. It was just too heavy. Then, we both heard the doorknob of our bedroom door turning. It was turning over and over again, almost like somebody was trying to come in, but they weren't jiggling it or trying to open the door. It was actually turning in a rhythm, back and forth, back and forth in a rhythm at about the same tempo like a metronome would. Like a beat to a song. It was very deliberate. We were both terrified, and we froze. The first thought in my mind was that someone had broken in, though I couldn't figure out why they would just turn the doorknob back and forth in a deliberate rhythm, especially because our bedroom door has no lock on it. They could easily have just opened it and walked right in. We couldn't move. That weird, gravity feeling that was holding us down still wouldn't let us go. But I was trying to move, and I could feel that my fiancé was trying to as well. All I was able to do was to very slowly turn my head and look over my shoulder at the doorknob and watch it turning. I could see it. Then we both heard it, singing. Two children's voices, what sounded like a pair of young girls, started singing a song that I couldn't make out most of the lyrics to. And the only clear lyrics that I could make out was the very last word at the end of the last sentence. Dancing. So, let me try to clarify. These two young girls' voices were singing an almost nursery rhyme type song outside of our bedroom door, while turning our bedroom doorknob back and forth to match the tempo of what they're singing. The doorknob is going as these little girls' voices are singing something that ends in dancing, and the doorknob would turn with each word they sang, keeping perfect rhythm. I couldn't make out nearly any of the other words of this song they were singing, except for the word dancing at the very end of each stanza, and they were singing it in a way that was kind of playful and taunting. Maybe, for instance, kind of like two little girls would do if they were teasing an older sibling or their mom and dad by coming up to a room they're in, shaking the doorknob and singing at them, just to tease. The song almost sounded made up, the way kids sometimes sing little made-up songs to be silly or playful. It also sounded like they were laughing or trying not to laugh while they were doing it. So as this is all going on and I'm watching the doorknob turn, as these voices sing to us, and near the end of their song, I turn my head in slow motion back to my fiancé to see if he's seeing and hearing the same thing I am. I can now see that he's finally managed to be able to turn his head, and he was watching the doorknob too. And the look on his face was just... I'll never forget it. His eyes were as big as dinner plates. I've never seen him that shocked or scared. His face was just white. And then the song ended. It was short, just two stanzas. And then just as soon as it started, the doorknob just 
stop turning on the very last word of the song, dancing. And all at once, that heavy, dizzy weight that had been holding us down and making it so hard to move and breathe just lifted, just went away, just like that. Suddenly we could move again and the air and gravity felt normal. It seriously was all over from start to finish in about 10 seconds, but it felt like forever. My fiance sat up and goes, what the hell just happened? He jumped over me and out of bed, raced to the door and yanked it open. Nothing was there. We don't have a hallway, it's a small house, and our bedroom door opens right up into the living room. He just looked out and goes, nobody's out there. I got up and ran over to him and looked for myself. Nobody there. House empty. Our two cats were both backed up against the far wall of the living room though, hissing and growling toward us. They'd either heard it too, or maybe even seen what did it. And from the spot right in front of our bedroom door, all the way through the living room, through the dining room and out to the kitchen door, there was this trail of heat. I don't know how else to describe it. It was just a trail of heat. The air just felt hot and oily. You could almost see a haze, like a fog, trailing from our bedroom door through the house to the kitchen door. We checked both the front door and the kitchen door. Locked. Both locked. We both sat back down on the bed and were just shaking. We kept asking each other, did that really just happen? We both heard the same thing, right? And yeah, we both felt the air pressure holding us down in bed and making us move in slow motion, if at all. And we both heard and saw the bedroom doorknob moving back and forth in a rhythm. And then both of us heard the two little girls singing that song. So I know it wasn't a hallucination or anything like that. The only difference was that my fiancé understood a couple more of the lyrics of what they were singing, though not many. He said it sounded something like, and we come in a dancing, or and we go a dancing. It was just so unsettling and spooky. And to be honest, the way the girls' voices sounded, they didn't sound mean or creepy. They seriously sounded like two real little girls who were just having fun and teasing us. It didn't feel or sound malevolent or anything, but obviously it still creeped us out. Just that it happened. We were both shaken up for the rest of the day, and I begged him not to leave for work that afternoon, but he had to. The whole time he was at work, I kept every light on in the house, along with both TVs in the living room and in our bedroom. It's never happened again, but it still creeps us both out just talking about it. I once had to work a very late shift at the funeral home to prepare a body for a viewing the following morning. I think I was finally finished about midnight. Anyway, it was winter, and I ended up getting snowed in at the funeral home. I had to stay the night until plows came early in the morning to plow me out. Let me tell you, it is freaking creepy sleeping in a funeral home, knowing that there are 20 dead people in the basement. I was 17, still living in my parents' house. Everyone was away on a Friday night, so I had a few friends over. We smoked a little and were chilling in the basement playing video games. Two of my friends ran upstairs to get some snacks out of the pantry. After a few seconds, they come running down the steps, yelling my name. They say that somebody just pulled into the driveway. I hear the dog start freaking out and I panic, thinking my parents are home. I scrambled to hide the paraphernalia that was sitting next to the back door. I walked up the steps and looked out the window. There was no car in the driveway, but my dog was still freaking out. I went outside to see if anybody was there. It was late, almost midnight, and cold. I was barefoot and poorly dressed. I walked around my house, shivering and nervous, and I found nothing. I went back inside took my dog down to the basement with me and tried to relax. 
Maybe 20 minutes later, we hear a huge crashing sound. It sounded like something had exploded right in front of the house. We ran outside through the back door, and we saw a car wrapped around a tree right by the road in my neighbor's front yard. My dog starts freaking out again. It was my brother's car. My brother, though, had gone with my parents to my aunt's and left his car in the garage. I ran to look inside, and there was nobody in the car. I immediately called my brother, freaking out. When he answered the phone, I was both relieved and confused. He instructed me to call the police, and he came home. The police came and looked around. They took statements from everybody. We hid the fact that we were high pretty well. As the tow truck was pulling my brother's car out of the front yard, the police received a call about a break-in down the street. They left an officer with us, and the rest left to respond to the call. It turns out that a group of people were going through my neighborhood, breaking into houses, stealing cars out of garages. I was in the house when the thief stole my brother's car. I may have even walked right past him at one point. When they caught the group, one of the guys was injured, as if he'd been in a wreck. He was the one who had broken into my house. I knew him. He had graduated from my high school when I was a freshman, and he house sat for us. He knew exactly where the spare key was, and he knew that if one of us was home, the doors would be unlocked. He waited until it was just me, alone in the house, or so he thought. It wasn't paranormal, but it still scares me to this day that the guy had waited for me or any other member of my family to be alone in the house and had broken in. It scares me that I was so completely unaware of my surroundings back then that I would have let that guy get the drop on me if he had had hostile intentions. It makes me sick that somebody we had trusted to stay in our house while we were gone would come back just a couple of years later and do something like that. When I was about 10 or 12, I don't really remember, I had an odd experience. At the time, I was sharing a room with my sister. We had lofted beds and I slept on the top bunk. We had this stereo, when you would press the button to turn it on, it would click and a red light would pop up. Our beds were on one side of the room and the stereo was on a desk on the opposite side. One night, I was woken up by the click sound that the stereo makes when the power button is pressed. I recognized the sound and I sat up in bed. I looked over at the stereo and the light blinks on. I look over at my sister and she's fast asleep. Her bed was under mine but perpendicular so I could see the top half of her from my bed. The stereo is playing that white noise sound that it makes when it isn't on a specific station. Suddenly, I can hear someone saying, Away, coming from the stereo. Just one word, away. First, it starts off soft and gradually gets louder until it becomes a yell. Away, away, away. It took about 10 to 15 seconds, probably, to build up to the yell, and then it died back down to a whisper. I thought this was a dream. I was frozen in fear. I thought this had to be my imagination, and I tried telling myself that during the entire thing. I had almost convinced myself of it, until it stopped. After the voice died away, the stereo went back to static, and then I heard the familiar click, and the light turned off. I was positive I wasn't dreaming that ending click. I stared at the stereo for a few more moments, too freaked out to move. I looked back at my sister and she was still asleep. Finally, I laid back in bed, covered myself with my sheets and willed myself back to sleep. I consider myself a rational person, but I had no rational explanation for this. It's the freakiest thing that's ever happened to me. I grew up in a small town and lived out in the country. 
My mom and I were coming home from Walmart really late one night and decided to take the back way home. I still had my learner's permit, so I wanted to take a road with less traffic. Anyone who's ever lived in or been to the country knows how creepy these roads can be at night. I was going around a curve right before a one-lane bridge, so I slowed down in case I had to stop. Out of nowhere, this woman jumps in front of me to the driver's side of my car and starts pounding on the hood of my car. Her mouth was moving, but I couldn't make out what she was saying. My mom started freaking out and told me not to stop, to just keep driving. I kept going and we both looked back to see where she was, and there was nobody there. To this day, my mom and I still remember it clearly. Turns out, there's apparently a legend about a woman who died around that bridge, and supposedly, sometimes late at night, people see her. I get goosebumps to this day just thinking about it. And this happened on Halloween morning one year. I lived in a small apartment with an open floor plan where you could see the entire apartment from the kitchen. I was in the kitchen, packing my lunch to take to work, when the TV turned on by itself, volume on full blast, to some staticky channel that kept cutting in and out. I was nowhere near the remote or the TV, and had no other people or animals living with me who could have done it on accident. Probably not the scariest thing I've ever experienced, and I'm sure there are probably many perfectly reasonable explanations as to how it happened, but it definitely freaked me out at the time. It had never happened before, and hasn't since. I play the piano, and a while ago, I was playing in a dark and empty auditorium, just practicing. When I was finished, Someone softly clapped for me. It kind of sounded like it was coming from everywhere, but it was just one person. I never saw them, and the auditorium was locked except for the door that I came in, and I would have heard and seen anybody who came in, passed me, and then went to sit down. I can't explain it to this very day. In middle school, my friend was in a church youth group, and they often had these overnights at the church that he would invite me to. They were actually tons of fun. Toward the end of the night, the guy who ran it, he was super chill, the Lord was with that guy, would let us play manhunt in the entire church area. Place where actual mass was held, kitchen, rec hall, nursery, all of it. We turned literally every light in the whole place off, and all we had were tiny flashlights. It was spooky, but it was so much fun. One of these nights we're playing and we decided to hide in a closet in the nursery. We hid there for about 10 minutes and out of nowhere we heard a baby crying. We got spooked. We bolted it out of there. In the morning we went back to the nursery to see what could have caused it. We figured it was one of those toy baby dolls that would cry, but we found nothing. It still spooks me to this day, but I would give anything to relive it because I love paranormal stuff. When I was 12, my mom and I were watching TV in her bedroom. It was one of those really stuffy summer evenings. Stating the obvious, I said aloud, It is so hot in here. Immediately, the fan that was sitting on the dresser five feet away turned on. The switch couldn't really be flipped on by accident. It was pretty sticky, so to speak, and required a little bit of force to go from off to on. I can't really explain how that happened, but I like to think it was just a friendly ghost.
A few weeks after my mom gave birth to me, she went to me in the middle of the night because I was crying. When she went into the room, she saw the dark figure of a man, who she thought was my dad, holding me and decided to just go back to sleep. In the morning, she thanked my dad for taking care of me. As it turns out, my dad wasn't even awake and nobody else was in the apartment. It gets worse later on in life. Not only me, but my sister, cousins, and friends have all seen it somewhere in our home, all on separate occasions, and we don't normally tell people about it unless they've seen it. It follows us wherever we move to, and at this point, my family and I have just learned to ignore it, even though we all know that it's there. When I was in university, I loved finding snakes. I was a biology student. So a friend from herpetology club showed me this road that he would cruise for snakes. Cruising is when you drive slowly down old back roads after dark, looking for snakes that have slithered onto the warmer road to heat up. The road we took was about four miles and had around four houses on its entirety. We'd taken a few laps on this road and we were making our final pass. There are two houses near the beginning of the road, one at the end and one near the middle. We were getting close to the center house when we see movement on the left side of the road. There are a lot of animals, obviously, on this road, so we're not surprised to see this. However, what shoots out is this kid, probably around eight or nine in torn blue jeans and a ripped dark t-shirt. He takes one look at us, and his face is a mix of fear and pain. He looked back really quickly from where he had just come out of, and then booked it across the road. The guy I'm with gets out of the car, chasing to see if he's alright, and I pull up the car to the point where the boy had gone into the woods. I'm starting to get out of the car when my friend walks quickly back from the trail and just says, let's go, now. We hop in the car and tear out of there. He says that there's a graveyard about ten yards into the woods where there are five gravestones with the same death date. They all had the same last name, and one belonged to a boy who was nine years old. We never came back the rest of the summer, not to that road. We usually would go out once or twice a week. The next year, when my friend had graduated, I took my girlfriend out to that road. We'd gone early to try to find different types of snakes. Different snakes tend to move at different points of dusk or night. We got to the house near the graveyard, and there's three men doing some yard work. I rolled down the window and explained what I was doing, and I asked them about the graveyard. Apparently, their dad's brother's family had all died when their space heater caught fire around 20 years ago. I kept pushing and asking about it, and they told me the firemen, or whoever does the investigation, had found all the bodies in the rubble, except for that of the youngest son but they assumed that he was just too far burned. I asked if they had a little brother, and the six foot four, 250 pound man said that he was the youngest. When I gave the description of the kid that I saw earlier with my other friend, they all went white. They all have individually seen the kid I was talking about, and he always runs to the gravesite. I've never been down that road again. A good friend of mine, while doing his rounds as a young intern, he's now a neurosurgeon, had just looked in on a dying patient. After making the patient comfortable, he exited the room, sat on a nearby chair to write his report, and after a few minutes he looked up and saw that this patient was walking down the hallway. He called to the woman, but there was no response. As he stood up to walk after her, she disappeared. He quickly walked toward the patient's room and saw a light under the door. When he opened the door, it was completely dark in the room. So he turned on the nightlight, went over to the patient and felt for her pulse. She had died. 
To this day, he swears to this experience. My mother was having dinner at a friend's house. It was a small old cottage that's been around for a hundred years. She tries to find the bathroom and pulls on a door that's locked. The friend sees and says, Oh, sorry, that goes to the basement. The bathroom is over there. Thinking it's odd, my mother asks why the basement door is locked. It's always locked, she said. In fact, I don't even think we have a key for it. The real estate agent advised me not to go down there as it hasn't been upgraded like the rest of the cottage. It's little more than a root cellar, I think. Fast forward a few weeks, when my mother, who works for the police department's community division, is working on a project about the history of the police department in town. An old man comes in with news clippings about various community events, as well as a news clipping from the 50s about a gruesome murder. My mom was a bit taken aback. Oh, sorry, I forgot those clippings were in there too. N no, it's okay, she said. I know this address. It's my friend's house. What happened there? Oh, said the old man. Well, that used to be my mother's house. She'd been dating this man who was cruel to her, beat her horribly. She tried again and again to break it off with him, but he'd always come back. Finally, my aunt moved in with us, and my mother finally broke up with him. He starts getting emotional. Then one night, he broke in. He tied my mother, aunt, sister, brother, all of them up in the basement. He shot them all in front of my mother, and then he shot her and killed himself, leaving a note that she'd never leave him again. I was away at college. He started to sob, and that is how my mother's friend learned that she has a haunted quadruple murder-suicide scene in her basement. She moved out a year later. I was a caretaker of a small, uninhabited island off the coast of Maine, and my girlfriend and I started having synchronized nightmares about things that we had never discussed before. They involved very specific themes, and after a month of this happening, we were gifted a history book of the island that had a small chapter in the back. It mentioned the exact haunting that we had had nightmares about. I was in my sophomore year of high school. I would usually get ready and then wait for my mother to drive me to school. While she was getting ready, I was just kind of hanging out in the bathroom with her while she was putting on makeup and curling her hair. She looked a little frazzled and I asked if everything was okay. She told me about a weird occurrence that had happened the night before. She told me that she'd been woken up at around two o'clock by a strange noise. It wasn't super loud, but it was pretty constant. My dad wasn't woken up by it, though it's not surprising as he sleeps like a log. Anyway, she starts looking for the source of the noise, first checking the bathroom attached to their room, but there's nothing in there. Next, she walks out into the hall and hears the noise from the bathroom nearby. When she walks in, she sees a hairdryer plugged in and turned on, just sitting in the middle of the bath mat on the floor. She thinks it's strange, but there are four kids living in the house, so she thought maybe somebody had sleepwalked and turned it on. Whatever. She unplugs it and puts it away. She goes back to bed and eventually she falls asleep. About an hour later, she wakes up again and hears the same noise. She's kind of pissed off, so she goes to check it out again. Except now the noise is from downstairs. She tracks it down into the guest bathroom in the main entry hall. My parents' house has like four bathrooms. So she opens the door and again, there's a hairdryer turned on, laying in the middle of the floor. She's freaked out by this point, but she unplugs it and puts it away. 
She didn't get a great night's sleep after that. So she's telling me this story, and as soon as she comes to the conclusion, we both just freeze and turn our heads to the walk-in closet off her bathroom. As soon as we look in there, the entire light on the ceiling shatters. Not the bulb, but the glass cover. It shatters, sending shards of glass everywhere. We both freak out and get the heck out of there. We didn't know what to make of it, but we haven't really had any experiences before or since, and none of my other family members have experienced anything either. I used to volunteer at a nursing home, where we had several instances where new residents accurately described former residents, down to specific nightgowns or color of glasses, who I and the staff knew had died in that room, and complain about them coming into the room at night. Then, once, I was walking through the hallway, and it was normally uncomfortably warm inside, but I felt a chill and goosebumps. One of the CNAs said that I had just walked through a ghost. I couldn't get warm again for the rest of the day. There were flickering lights and TVs that would turn themselves on. Several of the staff were from the same Southeast Asian country, and they were talking about ghosts and disrespect for the dead so much that management had someone come in to do a candlelight ceremony. This lady with crystals and dreadlocks came in to do a sage brushing. Things calmed down after that, Lights stayed on better, and the residents seemed calmer. I currently go to school at a private school, and it's split into two buildings. One is an old train station and the second building was a paper press building or something like that. My school buildings are very old. They were made in the late 1800s to early 1900s. The owner of the paper press building had a brother, and a few years before the school opened in 2012, he had gone into the elevator, and the elevator had fallen, and he died. When the other building was still a train station, two people had died from the train. One was a side and the other was an accident. This is my first year at this school and I'm currently in the ninth grade. I always have to go into school around an hour earlier than school starts because of my mom's work. There's only one teacher there when I arrive at school and every single morning I always hear a tapping on the window. At first I thought it was a tree but then I realized there aren't any trees around the windows. One night I was at my friend's house, who lives about a mile from our school, and at 2 to 3 in the morning we decided to go for a walk. We went to the school because we had nowhere else to go. We were just sitting at the table behind the school, and all of a sudden, every window that we could see had a banging sound coming from it. This was enough for us to run home and to not look back. In the paper press building, sometimes if I'm there in the morning, I'll hear an elevator moving then the door opening, and then footsteps coming from upstairs coming down. Upstairs used to be a bowling alley, and I was there with my teacher catching up on work, and we both heard bowling ball bangs and rolling around. There's nothing up there now anymore, besides really nice floors. I think it's safe to say that my school is definitely haunted. I can't get this experience out of my head, no matter how many years have passed. This happened way back in the late 2000s. I was in the 8th grade, and we were on a senior trip. I stayed in a hotel with two other girls. One of them was my friend, and another girl who we were somewhat friendly with. The first night in the room, during my shower, I felt like someone was behind me. Like standing really close to my back under the shower spray. I turned around quickly, but nobody was there. 
So I continued showering, but the feeling just got worse. When I finished my shower, I pulled the curtain open, and when I looked at the gigantic wall mirror, I saw a grotesque face right behind my shoulder. It was gone within seconds. I think I stood there frozen for like a whole minute before I practically ran out screaming. The next day, while we were getting ready to go out, the girl we were roomed with said that somebody was in our room last night. She heard the toilet flush, the sink go off, but then nothing. No one entered the room and nobody left, and nobody else was there but the three of us. We know because we checked every nook and cranny after she told us this. The second night, when we got back to our hotel room, I suddenly felt super sleepy. Like, I literally fell to the floor once I stepped inside and fell asleep. Which was odd, because I wasn't sleepy at all until we walked into the room. The other two couldn't move me, since I had an extra 50 pounds on them, so they just covered me up with the blanket, put a pillow under my head, and left me there. Then my friend said that sometime during the night, I had gotten up, used the bathroom, and crawled into bed. But I don't remember doing that. In fact, when I woke up on the third day, I was still on the floor. When I was growing up, there was enough family drama to want to scream. I spent most of my teenage years living with my older sister and her husband. She lives in a really old house in the downtown area of a city in Texas. Now this old house looked like it was about to collapse. Even to this day it does, and I'm in my late 20s now. It all started when I first began staying with her. Her son, when he would visit, would stay in the guest room. So I just had a habit of sleeping on the couch, because the room was typically taken. We had a long night of movies, snacks, and staying up, as siblings do, and she eventually went to bed. I remember slowly drifting off, and just as I was about to give in to the comforting lull of sleep, there was an intense feeling that someone was watching me. Now, downtown isn't known for being safe. I was hoping that I wouldn't look toward her window and see a face looking in to rob the place. Instead, I was greeted with a short, pale boy with no eyes. He wore old clothes. They looked to be 20th century. The overalls and everything, like a little house on the prairie vibe. He had dark hair and literally black holes where his eyes should have been. I'll never forget the wave of sadness that hit me. I began to cry. I can't even say that I felt fear. It was like I was thrown into a deep, instant depression. Finally, I was able to muster the strength to call for my sister. He continued to stare until she turned the light on. She refused to believe me that night. I was so insistent. Later, other things began to happen, and she started to see what I meant. Little things such as cabinets opening and closing in the middle of the day, doors opening and closing, running through the halls, the back gate being left open, but thankfully her dog stayed home. One night, we heard knocking on the door to the backyard. We always used that door because the front door and the side door weren't over by the garage, so it was just easier. Expecting her husband, who worked the night shift, to be coming home for his lunch, she opened the door and screamed. He was there, standing in the doorway, and just staring as he did before. The boy, not the husband. She also began to cry. That's when it got worse. The doors and cabinets opened and closed all day and night. You would feel somebody sit on the bed or the couch with you. Eventually, I took over the guest room until her son came to visit. I couldn't even face outward toward the mirror. Everything in me told me not to. So I would face the wall until I had almost fallen asleep and felt somebody sit on the bed with my sister, dead asleep. She also started seeing this boy standing in her driveway, 
staring out into traffic all day or night until somebody would drive up. The last two times we came into contact with him were the worst. One happened when we got back pretty late from Walmart. We had a spur of the moment midnight Walmart trip. We bought some groceries and food for all of the pets and came home. She stepped out into the garage and all we heard were deafening screams. I looked over to see my sister also screaming as a handprint formed on her wrist right in front of us. She dropped the groceries and we just left them there until morning. The last and final time was unfortunately all for me. She worked at a World War II museum that was just a couple of blocks away. I volunteered there. That was also haunted beyond belief, but that's another story. Anyway, she came to pick me up since I wanted to sleep in on my weekend and come after lunch to help clean the place. She agreed and just asked me to be quiet because her husband had just come home and she didn't want me to wake him. I knew the drill, drink some coffee, hang out, text some friends. I paused because I heard the shower running in their bedroom. John never showered with me there. So I peeked down the hallway, which had a direct view of their room. And John was passed out in bed. He wasn't even awake. I stood there for a moment, confused. Then I heard the running, the screams, and directly in front of me I hear, Daddy, no, please. I was then pushed right into the door to the outdoor garage and a whisper that said, help me, faded into my ear. I bailed. I ran outside just as my sister drove into the driveway under the garage. We never saw or heard from him again. She says that it's been peaceful since I left her house. He's never shown himself again. She has a huge hole under her house where animals go all the time, and I'm guessing that's where he is, and he showed me how he died that morning. I can say that I hope he is at peace, and that whatever happened to him never gets shown to anyone else again. Back in about 2004 to 2005, I worked in a group home, supporting people experiencing intellectual and developmental disabilities. I mostly worked nights, and since the clients in that home were pretty chill, we were allowed to sleep a few hours before getting our clients up and ready for the day. I usually slept on the couch, with my shoes on the floor next to the couch, and my cell phone, keys, and other things on the table in my shoe or next to my shoes. One morning I got up and started getting things ready for the day. I had left my phone on the floor in front of the couch. I was a few feet away from the couch, looked over, and I saw a hand reach out from under the couch, grab my cell phone and start to pull it under. I lunged down and grabbed my phone with one hand I pulled the phone back toward me, but I felt the resistance of whatever had a hold of my phone pulling it away from me under the couch. After a moment of tug of war, I pulled my phone from the grasp of the hand and it just disappeared back under the couch. I was really freaked out and even to this day, I get chills thinking about it. The hand was obviously thin enough to be able to slide in and out from under the couch from the wrist to the tip of the fingers was maybe three to four inches. The skin on this hand was gray and wrinkled, almost shriveled. And the nails, the fingernails were long, pointed, thick, and yellowish. I have no idea what it was that tried to take my phone or why it wanted it, but it really creeps me out.
My family and I moved to Colorado when I was eight, so around 1997. We lived with my brother and his family for a while, until my parents found a more permanent place to settle. We had a few terrifying experiences in this house, but the short version is that his basement was almost certainly home to something very bad. These stories are about my experiences in the house that we moved into after leaving my brothers. I will give you as brief of a description of the place as I can. My parents found this house almost in the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately, now it is surrounded by new housing developments and stores. But when we first moved in, there were just fields for miles and miles, and we had a very gorgeous jaw-dropping view of the Rockies. The land left adjacent to our property was Rocky Flats. That's the place where they stored nuclear reactors and who knows what else underground for years and years. They claim that it's cleaned up now, but we still have dragonflies bigger than my head in spring. And I once saw a two-headed bull snake in the backyard, so... Anyway, my parents got a good deal on rent and the landlord was fairly agreeable. To an outsider, though, the living arrangements probably seemed strange. Our landlord was basically renting out his basement, but the house functioned like an apartment building. We had our own entrances and our own driveway and garage. However, we shared the mailbox and the address. The main drive into the top portion of the house was a huge circle that branched off on either side going downhill into our section of drive and house. On your way down, you would pass this little brick building with a glass window and a very old, very visible toilet and a bunch of junk. It read General Store on the front. When my parents inquired about this strange setup, the landlord said that the whole property used to be a gas station a long time ago, when the highway that ran in front of the house was the only way into the mountains. Later, the big hill eroded a bit from the weather, and we found an old tank and bucket stuck in the hillside, corroborating the story. The rest of the area was farmland. A steep drop below us behind the house was a horse stable, and beyond that, a pasture, where a farmer would rotate Angus cattle throughout the year. All of this is just to give you a sense of the area. We were literally surrounded by nothing, and sometimes it was a bit terrifying, albeit beautiful. The first experience. One of my first nights sleeping in the house, I had a very vivid dream. As a kid, I never really had vivid dreams, so this was something entirely new to me. I remember walking out of my room, in my dream, and coming directly into the living room. My mother was sitting in her chair, staring at the TV, but there was a circle of people standing right in the middle of the room, people that I didn't recognize and who didn't register me being there. They were looking at something on the floor in the middle of the circle. When I squeezed past them, I realized that they were looking at a woman lying on the floor, presumably dead. She was wearing a long, mauve-colored Victorian-style dress, and her blonde hair was long and covered her face. I say she was dead because she wasn't moving, and a good chunk of her dress was visibly stained with blood. The most chilling part of this experience, however, was that her body was floating about four to five inches off the floor. When I noticed this detail, I also noticed that the people surrounding her were chanting. As soon as I noted these two things, I woke up, and that was all I remembered. My second experience. This one will forever give me chills when I think about it, and I will never forget it. I don't remember how long we had lived there at this point. I remember it being a normal night. My parents had gone to bed, and I was tucking in myself. I don't remember dreaming about anything else that night, and, if my memory serves me right, I had fallen asleep and instantly went into this experience. I'm laying in bed, eyes closed. I can feel that my body is asleep, but my mind is awake, and I feel eyes on me. 
I open my eyes and I see myself floating above me, staring down at me in bed. Then out of my periphery, I notice another me crouched in the entrance of my walk-in closet, also staring at me. Both of the other me's had glowing red eyes. I remember wanting to scream, and when I closed my eyes to do so, I opened them again and was now on the ceiling staring down into my bed. Bed me was still there, but it too had glowing red eyes now. Closet me was also still there. They were both staring up at me as I screamed in silence. They began to grin wider than any human should be able to. And then I fell. I woke up in that instance for real, drenched in sweat, still in my bed, and feeling like I was going to vomit. I didn't sleep the rest of that night, and I have struggled with terrible insomnia ever since. Experience three. Remember the cattle herd I mentioned earlier? Well, I'm pretty sure they were mutilated. My dad used to look out our back door with binoculars just to watch the scenery and spy on distant neighbors. One day, I came home from school and he hands me the binoculars and says, look at the cow pasture, tell me what you see. It took me a minute to center on the right area, but once I did, my jaw dropped. The field, which usually hosted about 50 head of Black Angus cattle, was completely empty, save for two black lumps on the ground. Ever since we moved there, that field had never been empty. We couldn't see properly that far away. So that night, my dad and I crept down the hill with some flashlights to get a closer look. The two lumps turned out to be two cows. No heads, no tails, no legs. And the torsos that were left were completely hollowed out. It wasn't like something had killed and then snacked on them over time. We had coyotes come through all the time, and they avoided these carcasses like the plague. They didn't smell, there was no blood or viscera, and the cuts were surgical. Everything about it made us really creeped out. The farmer that owned that chunk of land never came back with the rest of his cattle, and eventually a for sale sign was erected after the bodies had rotted away into nothing. Those are the three experiences I remember the best from that place. Don't get me wrong, it definitely had its beautiful moments scenery-wise, but living on what was previously known as Rocky Flats was definitely weird, to say the least. About 20 years ago, in my early 20s, I was going through a really rough time. One late evening in the dark, I was smoking a cigarette on the side of the house I lived in. All of a sudden, I see hands coming over the fence, as though they were going to pull themselves up and jump over. I just assumed it was my cousin, who also lived at the house, who might have been sneaking into the house. I asked, why are you jumping the fence? Then. I see a body being pulled up over the fence. It was in the form of my cousin, but it was not her. This thing was translucent and very scary. It jumped over the fence, landed in a crouched position, and immediately flew close to the ground very fast. It literally went through me, knocked me to the ground, and then flew away. It was as though the wind had been knocked out of me. My cigarette went flying out of my hand. I immediately run into the house and see my cousin in bed, asleep. I shook her awake and said, why did you scare me like that? She asked what I was talking about and that she was asleep and had been the entire night and had never left the house. I later asked my mom why this happened and she said that sometimes when people are having a hard time, those close to them linger over them in an out of body experience to protect them. However, I don't think that's the case. This thing felt 100% evil. Has anyone else experienced this? I haven't had any negative occurrences since.
The last two days have gotten crazy. For the past two years, there's been a tapping sound coming from my bedroom window. It started one Halloween night. I know, it sounds like a bad movie, but bear with me. And it's happened about a few times a month since, sometimes more often. Something taps at the window. There is nothing around to hit the window, and it sounds exactly like a finger tapping on the glass. My siblings and I are just used to it by now. A few days ago, my brother started complaining that something was communicating to him from outside the den window. Keep in mind, we live in an apartment complex, so we always have the blinds closed. He says that whatever it was just kept saying, hello, to him in a robotic, high-pitched voice. The rest of our family just shrugged it off. The day after, we go outside and there are small tracks leading up to all of our windows. I don't know what animal could have made those tracks because it's bipedal. Later that day, I was in my bedroom, laying in the bed that's next to the window, blinds closed, and I about jump out of my skin because someone is loudly banging against the glass. I ignored it. I just assumed it was one of my siblings sneaking up on me. I then found out that they were both together at that moment in the house while it happened and they hadn't been out for hours. The next night, my brother complained about the voice outside his window again, and we told him to ignore it. If it's something supernatural, we don't want to mess with it. Yesterday, while we were all preparing for dinner, my entire family and I heard the creature screaming outside. I was too shocked to move to grab my phone and record it. It kept yelling, Hello, come out! Hello, come out! Exactly how my brother had described. It was so loud we could hear it clearly from the kitchen and the dining room and really the whole house. We didn't want to look outside. This morning, more snow had fallen, but fresh prints were there. I don't know what to make of any of this, but it's impossible for this to be a prank because of the lack of human prints in the snow. I live in Northeast Ohio. If anyone has any information on what this is or has a similar experience, please let me know. I've worked in multiple prisons. Once, I worked in the prison that holds Florida's death row. This was before I transferred to a prison that was a lot closer to home. Due to the fact that I'm a female, they really did not want me on the row unless it was for training. I was training and during it, I was given a tour of the row and the death chamber. Our death chamber is comprised of two rooms. One holds our gurney for lethal injection, and one holds our electric chair. I wasn't technically working on the row, but we did have an inmate who was on death watch, and there needed to be an officer in there 24-7. Death watch is when the inmate is moved to the final holding cell before the execution, where they receive their last meal and everything like that. An officer came to relieve me for a 15 minute break and due to the size of this prison, I couldn't walk outside and have a cigarette in time. I decided to explore a little bit on my own out of morbid curiosity. I walked into the room with the gurney and saw it from the window and I felt my heart sink knowing that the inmate that I was watching over would soon be strapped down to it in just a few hours time. I ended up finding myself in the room with the chair, and when I did, something felt really off. I felt a mix of feelings, despair, anxiety, my mind was racing. I felt very uneasy, and I turned to leave, when from behind me I heard, you didn't think I would be back, huh? I felt like I was in an arctic tundra. I began to shiver, my spine was tingling. I was frozen in fear because I knew I had entered that chamber alone. I forced myself to turn back around, pepper spray in hand, just in case I ran into an inmate that somehow escaped from the row. 
I did run into an inmate, but definitely not the one that I was expecting to. I was staring dead into the face of Ted Bundy, sitting in the chair that he had died in. I couldn't move, I couldn't speak, my heart was racing and I felt like fainting. I began to back away slowly. It was like he was alive. He wasn't transparent. The only way that I would have known that I was seeing an apparition was because I knew he was dead. Still frozen in fear, I watched what appeared to be a completely alive Ted Bundy disappear like he'd never been there in the first place. I got the hell out of there and was unable to speak to anyone for the rest of the day. This story happens in the Latin American country I was living in at the time. I was a 22 to 23 year old female finishing my master's degree in the local university. I had a part-time job as a receptionist in an institute, and usually I had the afternoon shift. I left work every day at about 8.30 p.m. to go to the bus stop, then walk like five minutes to get home from there. Even though this is and was one of the most dangerous countries in the world, I lived in a relatively safe city in a good neighborhood. Still, I walked very alert of my surroundings and I was ready to run and call for someone if needed. This is where my story starts. For a few days, I had been seeing this very big, expensive white SUV with tinted windows driving around my neighborhood. I'd never seen it before, but I just thought it was a new neighbor. After a few days, I started noticing that the SUV seemed to follow me. It was always parked in a corner of my street and usually started driving when I walked past it. Obviously, this gave me the creeps, so I told my boyfriend and my parents. Since the driver never did anything, just drove, not even slowly at times, they said it could be a coincidence and it could be, in fact, a neighbor. What started as nighttime encounters that went on for several weeks, but not on a regular basis, turned into daytime encounters. This SUV started to follow me around the neighborhood, sometimes passing by me fast several times in a row, sometimes slow, almost at the same speed I was walking. I discreetly took note of the license plate and always kept it in my phone, as it was a popular year model SUV. I started to look for it everywhere I went, and I noticed that they followed me to other parts of the city. This really freaked me out, and I finally contacted the police. I didn't do it before because they're mostly useless. They of course told me that they couldn't do anything about it unless it was physical, otherwise they could assume that it was just a coincidence. I was in panic mode. I even dreamed about this situation. I alerted my parents, my boyfriend who was working in another city, friends and coworkers. I even told my boss and surprisingly, she let me go in and out of work at different schedules so as to try to avoid the driver. This seemed to work for the first week and I thought it was over. Silly me, it wasn't. One morning I was going to the bakery to buy some fresh bread for lunch and there was the SUV. They started to slowly follow me. I was very anxious. I still shake just thinking about it. The only thing I was thinking was that I needed to run, but I didn't want to alert them that I knew they were following me. For context, my street was very long and on one side there were only buildings. On the other side, there was a tall wall no houses, no people passing. My goal was to arrive to the little shopping center where the bakery was. But when I saw they were still following me, I knew that that wasn't a good option. They could get me on my way out. For the first time, it got confrontational. They rolled down one window and started to scream things at me. So I decided to go to my friend's office, which was on the second story of the shopping center. I quickly ran up the stairs and went into her office. I told her how they were following me and that this time I had an even worse feeling about it. She got scared also and told me to go hide in the bathroom and lock the door. 
A few minutes later, guess what? A chubby, balding man in his 40s walked in and casually asks her about me. He said he was driving down the street when he saw his cousin entering her office. Since it had been a while since he had last seen her, me, he wanted to say hi, but she didn't hear him calling her, so he parked his car and went up to greet her. He insisted that he had seen this cousin walking inside the office, but my friend, bless her, insisted with a poker face that no one had ever entered her workplace since a few hours ago. She said later that she was shaking inside, but she wasn't going to let them get the better of her. He asked if she was sure, and she kept telling the same story over and over and insisting that there was no one there and that she was all alone. She asked him to go. All the while, I was listening to this exchange from the bathroom. When he finally left, she closed her office and told me it was safe to go out. I cried. I was petrified with fear and terror, and so was she. We immediately called the police. This time, they took me more seriously, and as I had the license plate number, they agreed to patrol the neighborhood on a regular basis. My friend called her boyfriend, who was a taxi driver from the company downstairs, and he took me home because my legs were shaking and I couldn't even move. From that day on, I always had someone driving me in and out of work or school, or I took taxis, something that I hadn't done before because they're expensive. I think the police presence in the area spooked him, or maybe the police found him and had a talk with him. I never knew. I never want to know either. I shiver thinking about what his intentions with me were, but the fear comes back every time I think about him. My parents still live in the area, as does my friend, but I eventually moved out of the city. This may be a ramble of thoughts, but after recently hearing about missing 411 and the like, I finally felt like I could offer something that my family and I experienced a few years ago that to this day gives me a shiver. Hopefully you enjoy this story. I've been camping, solo backpacking, and hunting my whole life in Oregon and felt comfortable in the woods, and I have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago, my wife, daughter, and two German shepherds went camping north of Mount Jefferson, Oregon. We found our campsite to be the perfect setup for us and our two dogs, who need the privacy, since they're intimidating to other dog owners and can be loud when spooked. It wasn't an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off of a U.S. Forest Service road that had flat ground, full trees, and a fire pit. The first night, my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours. It was maybe two feet away from my wife and I's tent. We made the male German shepherd sleep with her in her tent. His name is Guts. That whole first night, neither my wife or I could sleep. We both heard footsteps, and they were heavy. Not like typical forest critters scampering around in the night. I was well armed because I was paranoid from having read recently before departing about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say, both my wife and I had two pistols and I had my rifle with me. The dogs are great at detection and that's why I felt my daughter could sleep alone because Guts is completely fearless and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night, which I ultimately decided had to be a deer or maybe some elk. Day two, morning. We go for a walk down the road and maybe 300 feet away, we see this circle area. I see this abandoned road where a rusted gate post was covered in vegetation. The gate was missing. Something of a blue color caught my eye, and Guts immediately takes off running down this abandoned road. My heart begins to race, because I think if it's another family camping like us, he's going to get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death. 
So I chase after him as fast as I can, and the rest of the family follow. He stops after 20 feet into the road, and me yelling his name. But I've covered just enough distance to see that there's nobody there. But there's something really off about the sight. I yell, Hello, is anyone there? Sorry about the dog. I got no response. My curiosity gets the best of me, and I have to see what the sight conditions are. As I get closer, I just know something is wrong. It had all the necessities for a campsite, including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table, everything. But every single item had been completely destroyed, smashed, and torn apart from what appeared to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles, puzzled why anybody would leave all of their camping gear behind, including a fairly expensive REI tent. I figured, well, someone left in a hurry and the animals got to the rest. It had to be the only logical explanation, right? Still, a propane tank and a cooler were flattened by something, and it certainly wasn't snowpack with tree coverage in that spot. As the afternoon rolls in, my daughter and I are playing ball at the campsite, and my wife goes walking maybe 70 feet north to do her business. I don't have a direct line of sight on her, but all of a sudden I see Guts make a mad dash straight toward her. Normally he would always be with me, unless he's called over, and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention, and I knew something weird was happening. So I ran over there and my wife starts jogging at me and I immediately draw my pistol. Guts has completely continued running into the forest another hundred feet before I call him and he stops. My other dog, Leia, who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader, is not taking point. I've had her for now seven years and this was the first time in her life that she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was full hair raised and attached to us at the hip. Again, anytime we hike or play, Leah is up front, bossing everything in her path, pausing to see where we all are and then continuing on. I asked my wife what had happened and she said, I was trying to pee and all of a sudden I felt all my hair raise. I knew someone was watching me. Then I saw Guts running toward me and I just got up to move toward you. We spent 10 minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails, no broken branches, nothing to point to what and where something might have gone. We decide that we're spending one more night since it's too late to pack up and drive, but we'll all be in the big tent together. Before we go to bed, I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used a mint can, some coins, and keys from our truck, and zip-tied it so that anything hitting the rope gave a little jingle. Very unsophisticated, but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent, our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the exact same thing that I have done with a rope that was so old and brown I didn't see it at first. It was broken and only a few pieces remained, but sure enough, it was tied at roughly the same height, about eight to 10 inches off the ground, and even had a few rusted washers on it. I immediately felt that someone had stayed here before and had put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree that I am, maybe 10 or 15 years ago based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia has now reached a new height but I had to make sure that the girls felt we were safe. And at the time, the only thing I could think of was when the evening came, I made them sit in the truck and I fired a clip of my 45 into the dirt as a signal to whatever was out there that we were armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that knows that we have two wolves and are armed and are too risky of a target so we can sleep safely. That night, we heard no footsteps, and the dogs never perked up and barked. We left early the next morning. Fast forward to today, and I watched the Amazon Missing 411 Hunted documentary. 
and I noticed the cluster smack dab close to where we camped that weekend, and a flood of dread rushes at me as I think of that mysterious abandoned campsite with the ripped tent and the smashed cooler and cooktop. We've been camping since and have enjoyed the beauty of the Pacific Northwest, but there was something there at that place that possibly took or harmed someone else less than 300 feet away from where we camped. We all thank our lucky stars that Guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon. As an update, Guts is no longer with us. He has journeyed into the next phase and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about him and how he likely saved us that night. He was a warrior, and his new brother, Geronimo, has his spirit. First off, I just wanna say that this has been ongoing for years we were literally 13 to 14 years old when stuff started going down. I'm 18 now and I have a lot more common sense, or I would like to think so. So please try and look at this from a 13 year old's perspective and try not to judge our actions too harshly. Also, this gives more context to the adults in our lives not believing us. I have ridden horses all my life, but have never kept them close to home. When the opportunity came to keep them five minutes down the road from my house and with my best friend's ponies, I was over the moon. Little did I know what was to take place over the following years. I will start this with a backstory. The horse I owned at the time came from a rescue that I volunteered at for five years. I was sitting down one day drinking a cup of tea with the owner of the rescue center as we usually did after a hard day of mucking out fields and dragging barrels of hay to the 40 horses and donkeys that lived there, when she told me about a farm that was just down the road from my house in a little village that we'll call Trophy. She said that her father had built that farm and that he'd be turning in his grave if he found out who owns it now. Immediately, I was intrigued, so I pushed for more info. She told me that the man who owns it now is Elliot, who is a pig farmer. He murdered his brother-in-law, who was asking him to pay back 150000 in debt. Apparently, he ground him up in a meat grinder and fed him to the pigs. He then moved those pigs two to three hours away for long enough so that when the police eventually tracked them down, any DNA would have been long out of their system. He was actually charged for murder, but ended up being acquitted by the judge due to lack of evidence. What's ironic is that he moved those pigs without a moving permit, which is illegal and suspicious as hell because moving permits are not that hard to get a hold of. So in the end, he got punished for the illegal transport of livestock and not for murder. She told me that although he was eventually found not guilty, everyone in the village knew that he did it. Now that we've got that out of the way, we'll go back to the farm that I would be keeping my horses at. I had known the owners for a while, as I used to ride one of Annie's horses, my best friend that I mentioned earlier. Nothing particularly scary happened while I was riding for her, except once. We had decided to ride down a different trail that day, one that went past an unfamiliar farm. We didn't know who owned it and we weren't sure if they were friendly, so we proceeded with caution. All seemed fine as we were riding through the fields until the path came to a stop. There were gates and guard dogs in the way. We assumed we must have taken a wrong turn, so instead of passing through the gates, we decided to carry on through the fields and around the outskirts of the farm. Unknowingly, we were now trespassing. The horses started to feel extremely uneasy beneath us. Mine would stop and shoot forward. Annie's started backing up into the brook that ran alongside us. Annie was hanging off hers, deciding whether to throw herself off before they both ended up in the ditch when I looked toward the farm. A man was stood completely still staring at us, 
I honestly thought he was a scarecrow at first, and I had no idea how long he'd been there. He disappeared after about 30 seconds of making eye contact with me. For some reason, it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. There was something so unsettling about him. A few minutes later, we finally got the horses under control. That's when we heard gunshots behind us. Guns are illegal in my country. Only licensed owners can have them. The only reasonable explanation was that somebody was scaring birds off their crops or shooting bunnies and they hadn't seen us coming. We went into a flat out gallop. We were terrified because if they really didn't know we were there, we could have been caught by a stray bullet. All the while we were looking back to see if any birds flew to confirm our theory. They never did. That shot was meant for us, to warn us to stay away. Later that night, we looked back at the map to see where our wrong turn had been. The gates were where the trail carries on, but who in their right mind would go past a bunch of snarling guard dogs? At any point, that man could have redirected us. Shooting toward us was pretty psychopathic. We didn't tell anyone that day, as we thought we would get in trouble for trespassing. But that's only where the problems began. When I brought Eric to the farm, things calmed down. There were odd scenarios that played out. Sheep were stolen, our ponies were let out, and a white pickup truck would be seen prowling the area often. But again, nothing too serious. That was until October of that year, when we would end up riding in the dark as the days were shorter in the winter. This particular evening, we were just goofing around and laughing, like 14-year-olds do, when we heard an owl hooting. It was coming from one of the fields that the scary farmer owned. I began imitating it, joking around, and not really expecting a reply, but it did reply. I found this hilarious, and Annie began joining in. This carried on for about five minutes, which in hindsight, was definitely a red flag. Any owl would have stopped replying within the first two or three calls, realizing that it wasn't speaking to one of its own. This one always replied and sounded louder every few calls. The longer this went on, the less owl-like this thing sounded. There was a moment where the noise almost sounded strangled. And that was when Annie turned to me and said, that is not an owl. We realized that we had just led whoever was in that field right to us. They could now pinpoint exactly where we were. We turned our flashlights off and ducked, trying to be quiet, which is difficult when you have a 1200 pound animal squishing through the mud underneath you. We decided screw it and we galloped the rest of the field back to the farm. What we didn't realize was that the weight of the horses had left deep hoof marks in the soil, leading straight back to us. We were freaking out as we got back, but the adrenaline began to wear off and we ended up laughing about it while untacking the horses. We were about to lead them to the field when we heard the crunch of broken glass being stepped on from one of the old greenhouses opposite the stables. It was pitch black except for the dull light coming from behind us so we couldn't see anything. Immediately, we turned all the lights off, picked up a pocket knife that we used to cut hay bags open with and hid behind the stable door. We waited for 10 minutes with no phone signal to call the police, but didn't hear a thing, scared to even breathe in case it made too loud of a sound. I decided to be brave and make a dash for the horses who were tied up outside thinking that if I could jump onto one, I could get out of there quicker than whoever I might see. My eyes had adjusted to the darkness, so I could kind of see into the greenhouse. I shouted back to Annie, there's no one here, we're just being paranoid. Again, we laughed it off, trying to shake the terror that we had just experienced. It was only the next day that it became very, very real. The next morning was hot. The ground had baked and preserved the hoof prints we left from the previous night. However, there was something else in between them. Massive boot prints leading from the field we had heard the owl in 
all the way back to our farm. That was where the nickname Farmer Bigfoot came about. We told our parents, but they decided that we were just making drama out of paranoia and didn't believe us, and that was that. These boot prints started appearing a lot. We would skate on the ice where the fields flooded over in the winter. We noticed the prints a few times, stopping on the edge of the field where we would skate, and then continuing in the opposite direction. We didn't ever see anyone watching us, though. I lost Annie's phone in the fields one night. We went looking for them in the dark. The next morning, footprints. Farmer Bigfoot footprints. Our trail started getting blocked off. First, a huge tree. I'm talking a couple hundred years worth of trunk and branches was brought down onto our trail. It was then set on fire after we cut ourselves a path through it. When we weren't being deterred, they seemed to give up. Until 2018, when huge mounds of rubble started being dumped on our trail. This time, the trail was basically inaccessible. We spoke to a man who lives on the corner, who told us that he didn't want to name the farmer who was behind all of this, but that we should report it as it is illegally blocking a bridle path. We tried to report it, but the council won't go near him because he's too scary of a man. This guy told us that we were being watched and to be careful. Now this freaked us out. But us being stupid kids, we stayed from 5 p.m. till 9 p.m. clearing a path through the rubble. We also wrote F.U. in stones just for effect. The next day, there were three more piles of rubble and our path was covered over. We were at a loss, so we decided to talk to one of the neighboring farms that keeps horses. Without telling us a name, she said, you have to be careful messing with him. Around here, he's known as the man who makes people disappear. And that's when it clicked. This whole time, we'd been messing with Elliot. Farmer Bigfoot was Elliot. The same Elliot who fed his brother-in-law to the pigs. No wonder the council wouldn't go near him. Again, we tried to tell our family, but nothing came of it because they thought we were just being dramatic. Things continued happening. Bones were left on top of the rubble piles. Again, I'm guessing this was to scare us. A whole herd of sheep were stolen. The horses kept being let out. The owners of our farm would never say who they suspected, but we all knew who it was. The white pickup would turn up almost every week. We started leaving breadcrumbs on our Snapchat stories, thinking if it was weird enough for people to screenshot, we'd have multiple witnesses if anything happened to us. We told friends that if we disappeared, make the police look at Elliot. We were terrified. It quieted down after a while, until September of last year. We had just ridden, and I was leading both horses back to the field on my own. It's down a dirt track about a two minute walk from the stables. I walked through the wooded area on the track, and immediately this smell hit me. It was vile and I knew what it was immediately. Death, literal rotting flesh. It was enough to make you gag. I put the horses out and immediately ran back to Annie to come and investigate with me. The farm owner, we'll call him Ryan, overheard me and went into the house to grab a flashlight. Annie has a weak stomach, so as soon as the smell hit her, she threw up. It was so strong and so disgusting. Ryan soon joined us and said, someone has definitely been in here. That just added to our fear. Annie had recovered from her vomiting fiasco and rejoined us in a search. Ryan then said, I really don't know what we're going to find out here, girls, but I don't think it's going to be an animal. Our fear meter was now at the max, but morbid curiosity drove us forward. After an hour of searching, we decided to unstack a pile of wooden pallets. And that's when we saw bags of white flesh. They were clear Ziploc bags. Maggots crawled inside the bags, but there were no holes, implying that whatever meat was in there had been rotting for a good while before it was cut up and put in the bags. 
It was the most surreal experience. After more vomit from Annie, we decided to call it a day, reassured that Ryan would now deal with whatever the hell this was. We assumed that he would have called the police. We got home and cried to our parents, but again, they dismissed it. How the hell are we being dramatic when we just found chunks of rotting flesh in the woods? Anyway, Brian is hands down one of the loveliest men on the planet. We always felt safe around him. But what we found out days later was extremely questionable. He didn't call the police. He buried the meat. He didn't throw it out. He buried it. What the fuck? We assume now that it's because he's old and vulnerable and he didn't want to get involved in anything that might put him or his family at risk. I still have no idea why Annie and I didn't phone the police. I'm guessing because we didn't want to cause trouble for Ryan. And no one else believed us, so why would the police? This is, unfortunately, I guess, where my story concludes. I know, how unsatisfying. I'm no longer at the farm, but I still have horses. My parents now believe everything I told them. I think maybe because I've kept telling them for the past five years. In hindsight, they wonder why the hell they didn't move the horses out of there. Annie and I are still best friends, and we reminisce from time to time about how we were stalked by a murdering farmer for nearly three years. We will never know what that meat was, or if Elliot had anything to do with it, nor will we know why he followed us all those years, trying to stop us from riding down our very own bridal path. But honestly, I'm not sure I want to know. I'm really just telling this story as a way to vent because I'm in a situation where I really just feel stuck. I've tried just about everything, so I guess I'm just gonna start from the beginning. This story is two years in the making, so I'll try to be as thorough as possible. In 2019, I graduated with my master's degree and moved to a relatively rural area for my PhD. Thinking we'd make an investment, my dad and I purchased a house. The intent was to rent it out once I completed my PhD. This house was only a block away from a dive bar where my dad was able to make some pretty good friends. He introduced me to everyone and everyone let me know that I would be so happy in my new house because my next door neighbor was the absolute nicest guy you could ever meet. So we met the neighbor and he did seem nice enough. He suggested that we exchange numbers just in case I ever needed anything. And I thought that was a good idea. What's the worst that could happen? A few days later, my dad left to go back to his home in another state, and I was left to my own devices. Literally the day after he left, it started. My neighbor texted me while I was away and let me know that he left a gift for me on my front porch. In this text exchange, he started using pet names like Sweetie and Cutie. I went home and he had left a hand-painted feeding dish for my cats in my mailbox. At this point, I wasn't that alarmed. He was just being nice, I thought. The next day, he sent me more texts with pet names, and I took the opportunity to make sure he knew that I was not interested in anything romantic. He replied back with a rambling text about how all a person ever needs is friends and he would just like to be friends with me. After that, he would send me texts frequently, everything from inviting me fishing to telling me that he left more gifts on my porch. I would often not reply, or I would tell him that I was busy. I didn't want to be rude, but I also had no interest in any sort of relationship with him other than being neighborly. One night, I got a text from the manager of the bar down the street, letting me know that if my neighbor knocked on my door, I shouldn't answer. She then told me that my neighbor had walked down to the bar with a hatchet and told the bartender he was hearing voices that got louder as he got closer to the bar. He threatened to kill someone with the hatchet if the voices didn't stop. 
They called the police, and the police took the hatchet from him, but made no arrest. The manager of the bar picked me up, and I spent the night at her house. She told me that the police said my neighbor was heavy into meth. After that, I tried to keep my distance even more, but things got weirder. One day, I went out to my car, and I found a dead squirrel in my driveway. The squirrel had very clearly been run over and moved to right in front of my driver's side door. I just stepped over it, got in my car, and left. When I returned home, the squirrel was gone. Shortly after, I received a text from my neighbor that said, Someone or something put a dead squirrel in your driveway. Don't worry, I moved it for you. I felt like this was a weird way to word this, and I suspect he's the one who put the squirrel in the driveway. Another time, I walked out of my house to see that he had placed an unspent shotgun shell on the bricks in front of his yard. He came out and told me that it was to serve as a warning for anyone walking between our houses. For the next couple of months, I did my best to avoid him. He would text me, inviting me over, and I would come up with an excuse or just ignore him completely. I wanted to remain cordial, since he was my neighbor, but it was getting very annoying and I was uncomfortable. He would text me as soon as I got home, telling me that he was watching me come and go from my house. On Halloween, he handcrafted a large casket and wrote, here lies the last son of a bitch who played mind games, November 2012. I mean, what the hell, right? All this time, he's still sending me texts. Eventually, I got really fed up and I just stopped responding completely. Less than two weeks after I stopped responding, he threw a 50 pound flower pot at my front door. You know, those big concrete planters? Yeah, one of those. I called the police who advised me to get a stalking no contact order. A few days later, I was watching TV when a notification popped up that my neighbor was trying to cast a video to my screen. I declined it, twice. I filed another report with the police. During this time, I started the process of getting a stalking no contact order. I saw three different victim advocates who all told me different things. I went out of town for a conference and during that time, someone had attempted to break into my home. I had an ADT security system, so while they didn't succeed, I was aware of the attempt. After the conference, I came home to the entire world shutting down because of the pandemic. I was trapped in my home 24 seven with my stalker neighbor next door. Luckily, court proceedings for protection orders didn't stop. Right before court, he sent me a text telling me that he was sorry for what he'd done that he could tell when he saw me outside that he made me uncomfortable. Then he went on to tell me that he could tell my hair had gotten longer and I looked beautiful. I went to court and provided all of the evidence I had, the timeline of everything that had ever happened, the texts he'd sent me asking if I wanted a massage, the texts I sent him telling him that the way he was speaking to me was inappropriate, the text saying he knew he made me uncomfortable, I told the judge that I suspected he had attempted to break into my house while I was out of town. The kicker is he didn't deny any of it. Actually, he told the judge that he took full accountability for everything. He said he was in recovery and was trying to turn over a new leaf. He didn't oppose to the protection order at all. So in March of 2020, I actually received the stalking no contact order. Everything was pretty quiet for a while. I mean, he did some weird things, but that's because he's a weird guy. It wasn't anything that made me fear for my safety. That is, until he started using again. At this time, we found an unspent shotgun casing in my flower bed. It was consistent with the one he had previously used to send a warning. This occurred a couple of months after I started dating my boyfriend, and I suspect it was a warning to him. After this, and for a variety of reasons, my boyfriend moved in with me. He moved in pretty quickly, but everything turned out fine. We're still together and happy as can be in our relationship. New Year's 2021, I was awoken to yelling. I turned on my security cameras and I got footage of him sticking his head out his window, screaming obscenities at my bedroom window for seven full minutes. 
It doesn't sound like a long time, but when your stalker is screaming threats and obscenities, seven minutes is a lifetime. He called me a harlot. He said, happy effing new year. He said he was going to blow up his house with his gas line. I called the police who responded. They told me that because he never said my name, they can't prove it was a violation of the protection order. The officer said, and I quote, there's nothing illegal about yelling in your own house. They left without even speaking to him. All I could do at this point was do my best to avoid him. I parked on the street because my driveway is pretty close to his front porch. I got used to living with my curtains drawn. I always made sure my cameras were charged, all five of them. Yes, because of him, I spent over a thousand dollars on cameras. Every inch of my yard is covered. Since then, he's been seen by me and by other neighbors talking to people who aren't even there, going outside and screaming nonsense, things like, I have Cheerios on my necklace and other things. I'm not even joking. This basically brings me to last week. In the morning, I was getting ready for the day when I heard screaming. Someone is gonna die over this sweatshirt. I turned on the cameras. I got footage of him walking around the alley behind my house, screaming. Are you effing proud? How about I get my shotgun? I'll get everyone all fired up. I called the police. Once again, they didn't charge him with a violation of the protection order. Instead, they gave him an ordinance violation for disturbing the peace. The police told me that it seemed like he's off his meds again, and that was that. They left. Last night, I was awoken to hammering outside my window at 1 a.m. He was cutting down his privacy fence, horizontally. I called the police for a noise complaint and they just told him to stop. As I write this, he is outside continuing to horizontally cut down his privacy fence. That means the privacy fence only stands about three feet tall now. This was the one thing that made me feel relatively safe about hanging out in my own backyard, and now that's gone. All of this to say, I'm freaking tired. I just wanna live in a house where I can be sure that my neighbor won't try to kill me, where I can feel confident that he's not going to try to break in. My boyfriend and I are trying to buy a house and to move, but it's difficult. I'm a PhD student, so I don't make very much money. Renting won't work because I have four cats. Plus my partner's cat and dog, although we have a place secured for them if necessary. And finding a place to rent with so many animals is difficult, if not impossible. I refuse to rehome them. So maybe it's partially my fault that I'm stuck in this situation. My dad has agreed to co-sign on another mortgage and I've gotten a second job. We should be able to save up enough money within a few months, but until then, I'm stuck. I just don't know what else to do. I'm tired, I'm angry, so I figured I would tell this story to vent. This isn't even everything that happened. It's just something to give you an idea of what's been going on. I'm just so exhausted. This happened a couple of years ago when I was around 13 to 14 years old. I would go to Nerf Wars with my friends during the weekends with a semi-auto rifle and one of those revolver looking pistols as a sidearm. On one of those occasions, I brought my girlfriend to the Nerf War with me. For some context, my girlfriend's my neighbor. She lives in the same area I do and we've known each other for some time, since around preschool, I think. As you do for a Nerf war, you pack up spare darts, spare mags, etc. So the Nerf war ended and we had a great time as usual and we went our separate ways. As my girlfriend and I start walking back home, my paranoia kind of kicks in and I have a feeling that someone is following us. I glanced back slightly and there was a guy in full black. At first I thought it was just one of my friends awkwardly following us. But then I remembered that none of them were wearing full plain black that day. So I turn back to my girlfriend and tell her that I think we're being followed. She glances back slightly and sees the same guy. She starts panicking, so I tell her to calm down. 
It's probably just some guy going to the subway as well. So we get on the train, hoping that the man would stop following us. As I'm making sure my rifle isn't bothering anyone, I didn't have space to store my Nerf rifle even when it was taken apart, so I just had it slung around my waist. I feel my girlfriend's grip on my hand tighten. Then she whispers, telling me that the man was on the train as well and was staring at us. At this point, I'd had enough of this guy's crap. I was tired, and the last thing I needed was some dude stalking my girlfriend and I. Luckily, our stop was two stations away, so when we got there, we bounced right out of that car. I looked back, and the man was indeed behind us. We get up to the streets, hoping that there would be at least someone or some sort of camera that would be able to see my girlfriend and I. But the streets were basically empty, with only a couple of people going back home. My girlfriend was trembling beside me, scared as all hell. I told her my plan, and with some hesitancy, she agreed to it. I stopped moving to take a drink of water, my girlfriend shifting her hand toward my leg so it wouldn't be as obvious. It was dark at the time. I felt her hand being ripped away from my leg, and I heard her terrified screams. I decided to grab the closest weapon I had on me, the stock of my Nerf rifle. The stocks attached to Nerf guns with two clips latching onto them, so it wouldn't take long to pull it on or off. My stock was pretty big. It wasn't metal, but it was a solid piece of plastic that could do some damage to someone's face. I whacked the guy around the face, grabbed my girlfriend's hand, and got out of there. We waved down the closest taxi, got on, and sighed, happy that we weren't being followed by some guy. I don't talk about this incident much, but I just wanted to share it and get it off my chest. Because of that incident, I stopped playing Nerf for a while. My Nerf's been stored in my Nerf armory for a couple of years, untouched. Every time I think of it, this incident comes to mind. help breaking this down and I need to feel like I'm not crazy. I'm a court clerk. I work for my local courthouse. I work both in the office and in court, and I split my time about half and half. On a Friday in April, I was in the office at my desk. I sometimes also assist customers who come into our office who have questions on certain types of filings. I'm the backup coverage specifically for our records window. In my state, we are considered public records. Anyone can come in and request copies from any case, unless it's juvenile, confidential, or sealed by the court. I was asked to cover the records desk from 4 to 4.30 p.m. on this Friday, so our records clerk could leave a little bit early. No problem. I have no issues helping out when I can. Around 4.15, we had a frequent flyer, as we have so dubbed them. This man comes in frequently to get copies of his case. I should really note the way my office is set up because it is a bit important. We are set up kind of like the DMV. You have to come into the main entrance of security, go down a long hallway, and it opens up to a lobby. There are elevators straight ahead, and the DA's office is to the left, and the clerk of courts, or COC, where I work, is to the right. You have to open a separate set of doors into our little lobby. There's a counter with windows, and it's an L shape. The records window is around the corner, tucked in the back. There are also three public terminals where any member of the public can use to research cases in my county. So back to the man. We'll call him Joe. Joe has an open family case. He comes in probably once a week to get copies out of his family's case. Or whatever he's doing. I don't really know and it's none of my business, but I assume that's what he's doing. He came up to my window somewhere around 4.15 to 4.20 and said that he requested some documents. When documents are requested from the public terminals, they go to a queue, which I then go into and select them to print. I went into the queue, glanced at the document, and asked, did you have 11 pages? He said yes, so I selected and printed. 
I wrote him a little slip out with a number of copies and his total owed. I gave him the slip, directed him to go back to the windows four through five for cashiers for payment, and that I would meet him there. I went to grab the copies off the printer, which jammed. I messed with that for a minute, counted the pages and took them to the cashier. Then I went back to my counter to help the next person in line. The next customer was easy. Her records were prepaid and printed. After the second customer, it was after 425. My coworker Lynn asked me if I wanted to go thrifting for clothes at Plato's closet after work. And my answer was, hell yeah, let's go. Right as we're discussing this, I'm in view of the records window, but not at it. I saw that Joe had returned to the counter. I went up to the counter and I asked how I could help him. He stated, you must be new. I'm not new. I've been at my job for almost four years and in the legal field for almost 10. I replied, no, I'm not. How can I help? He then made a comment about a paperweight I was using. It was a gift from my niece, a painted rock from a three-year-old. That's a fancy paperweight you have there. Sir, what can I do for you? You gave me the wrong case. No, sir. I printed off what was in the queue. So you don't need these four pages? I tossed the four pages and then adjusted his slip, seven pages total, and I sent him back to the cashier. At this point, it's 4.30, it's Friday, and we're closed. I left and headed to Plato's closet. It took me about 15 minutes to drive over there. I sat in my car for a few minutes and then went inside. I beat Lynn there, so I started browsing. She came in a couple of minutes later, stating that she got caught behind a train, so we start shopping and chatting. For some reason, I looked at the door when it opened. There was Joe. Now, I knew it was Joe because he wears that dumb sock monkey hat. I saw him and got Lynn's attention. Um, are you seeing what I'm seeing? So I pulled Lynn into an aisle and we ducked down. She's short. I'm tall and I wear heels a lot. I could watch his dumb hat around the store. He immediately went to the back of the store and he looked like he was rubbernecking it the whole time. So he goes to the back of the store, grabs a pair of shoes, glances at them and continues looking around. I continued to watch him and as he moved, we moved opposite. We were legitimately hiding behind the clothing racks. He moved around the perimeter of the store continuing to just gawk around, looking for something or someone. He finally leaves, and we freak out. We check the parking lot to make sure he's gone. We try and shake it off and just chalk it up to coincidence. And then I realized that we were talking about it literally in front of him. And Lynn, she's not quiet. She gets scolded on a weekly basis for her loud carrying voice. I told the cashiers what happened, just in case it was something to worry about, and we ended up leaving like an hour later. The next day, I felt so uneasy about it. I called my boss and told her what happened and told her that I thought about calling the police, the non-emergency number. I did, and I left a message with dispatch. I got a call from an officer a few hours later and I explained what happened. He said to get Joe's name, at this point, I recognized him but didn't know his name offhand, and he told me that he would call me back on Wednesday when he was back on duty. I got Joe's name and called the officer back on Monday and left a voicemail. Monday was fine. Tuesday, I was out of the office. But Wednesday? Joe came back on Wednesday. He came in at 4.20 to file documents into his case. He took 20 minutes to file two affidavits and a motion. For reference, it should have been like a minute. Two, because he needed something notarized. He left and I just had a bad feeling. I called the officer and told him what happened. The officer said that if he comes back Thursday to call and they would come down to talk to him. The police department is across the street from the courthouse. Thursday rolls around, no Joe, until 425. He beelined it for the computer in the corner. I messaged my boss. We had already put into place a safety plan. The sheriff's deputies who work security were notified. 
Three deputies followed him into my office. I called the PD. Two officers came down and they questioned him. He admitted to being at Plato's closet. He said he was shopping for his two young daughters, nine and 11. Problem is they don't fit into clothes at Plato's yet. Plato's has a sister store, once upon a child. Those kids don't really fit there either. So he had a receipt in his car for once upon a child for 5.07 PM. He denied hearing my conversation with Lynn regarding going to Plato's after work. He stated he left my office at 4.15 and took his children shopping for clothes. He did not have his children with him at the courthouse or at Plato's. He also asked the officer immediately and unprompted, did she call you? He also stated that he believed his ex-wife was setting him up. So because my office is a public office and he has arguably legitimate reasons to come into my office, there's really nothing the officers can do. They issued him an oral warning and put him on standby. The kicker is he could opt into his case electronically, but he made this big deal about not being able to opt in a few months ago. We told him if he was having issues, he could call the court support line and they would be able to fix the situation. Instead, he chooses to come in and pay $1.25 a page instead of a one-time $20 fee. Apparently, he also paid that. If you weren't already freaked out, last year, his roommate filed a restraining order against him, followed by his roommate's girlfriend alleging sexual harassment. I won't go into details regarding the family's case, but let's just say it's more than messy. He's also filing extremely high level types of documents for being somebody representing himself. Today, I was in court all day, came down to my desk at around 4.05 p.m. and he came in at about 4.10 p.m. I left while he was still at my office. I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do. The officers can't do anything else. I need another incident outside of my office to file a restraining order. I have ordered home security. I signed up for self-defense classes and I'm purchasing mace. I don't know what else to do. When I was 15 years old, I was doing a four o'clock AM newspaper delivery round on bicycle. Everything was going pretty normally. Then I was driving into the garden area of this one subscriber where I saw two guys with flashlights looking through the windows of the house. I was a bit in shock. So I just said, uh, good morning guys. They were in just as much shock and an awkward silence followed. I tried to break the silence by asking if I could ask them to deliver the newspapers through the door. One of the guys said the person living in that house did something to his family. And then they both took that as an opportunity to get away in their car, which was still running. When they were gone, I rang the doorbell at the house to tell them what had happened and to tell them that they should probably keep an eye out. I used to be a supervisor for a janitorial company, and a couple of times a week, I had to go to a middle school and clean their hallway floors and gymnasium with a Zamboni type vehicle, which mopped and scrubbed the floor. When I was there, I had the whole school to myself. I used to get finished quickly and go to the library and read while eating my dinner. Well, one morning after being there, I got a call from school security. They wanted me to come in. When I get there, I see a police car too. Understandably nervous, I go in. They ask me a few questions like, did you notice anything out of the ordinary or strange while you were here last night? No, I said, I hadn't. I usually had headphones in anyway. Security then shows me camera footage of someone breaking into one of the classrooms while I was riding the Zamboni not far away. I was there for another two hours, completely unaware of this. Nothing was stolen, but the worst part was they didn't have footage of the person leaving. 
they didn't go out the way they'd come in, and police had to sweep the entire school. Never did find out what happened with that one. But the fact that I was in there, completely alone, with someone who clearly had bad intentions, totally unaware, yeah, that freaked me out. My mom used to live in a small town in the Cascade Mountains. She worked as a forest ranger. She told me about a very scary thing that happened to her. The oldest male ranger kept hitting on her and trying to get her to come home with him. I know that doesn't sound very out of the ordinary, but wait. He kept trying and kept trying, but she would never go with him. And finally, he just gave up. Also, she left the town after a while, so he wasn't her problem anymore. But many years later, after she'd left the town, she found out that he had been convicted of manslaughter and had killed a young female ranger right before she got hired. She's pretty sure that had she gone home with him, she would have been his next kill. This is my dad's story. After he was done in Vietnam, he soon was stationed at an Air Force base in Greenland. They had bad blizzards often there, and when they came through, the base shut down, and every section of the barracks would take roll call. These blizzards are intense. There were cables running between all the buildings that you attach to your person with a carabiner, so that if there was a sudden whiteout, you didn't get lost and die. They had people die literally 20 meters from shelter because they got lost in bad weather and couldn't see and froze to death. He said for about five months, every time they locked down for weather, they would hear horrendous screaming outside, not just the wind, human screaming. Everyone was accounted for, so they didn't risk sending anyone out to investigate. They wrote it off as an animal. However, every time this was heard, the engine room would be wrecked. Tools everywhere, paperwork all over the floor, tables and toolboxes knocked over. Even one time, a several thousand pound jet engine had been lifted from its workbench crane thing and smashed about 30 feet away. The hangars and engine rooms had cameras covering every single possible entrance with spotlights that made them clear, even in a whiteout. No animals, no people, no anything was ever seen entering or leaving those buildings. Then one day, it just stopped. This was not something that they just shrugged at. It cost a lot of money and threw a wrench in at least one surveillance routine, which caused a lot of brass from the DOD and the CIA to breathe fire down the base commander's neck. This facility, beyond military function, served as a base for a lot of civilian research as well. There was a full investigation using all manner of scientists, engineers, and specialists. They came up with no satisfactory explanation for what was happening. I do not believe in the paranormal, nor did my father. This is the only spooky type story he has from 22 years in the service. No one knows what happened. It was strange in every way. Hundreds of people wrote reports and documented this. That said, I spoke to my mom, and she told me a couple of other things. After one of these occasions, the U-2 in the shop had all its electronics turned on. Many of the systems in this plane were special built for this airframe and this particular crew's mission. These systems were complex and archaic. Very few people knew how to operate this machinery and the only ones on base that could were two engineers and its crew. It wasn't a simple matter of hitting power buttons and flipping switches from off to on. Another time, three barrels of hydraulic fluid vanished and were never found. They doubted the screaming noise was the wind because it came in short, irregular bursts, 
and wind almost never produces those sounds. At least there it didn't. They theorized it might have been a polar bear, but if it was, its coincidental timing was extremely uncanny. Lastly, Control picked up a bunch of weird interference and anomalous readings that, again, had the uncanny timing of happening only when all of this was going on. They were never able to reproduce these errors in a controlled setting. I was by myself in the engine room of a submarine on the mid-watch, just a newly reported sailor trying to find equipment so I could display my knowledge to one of the watchstanders. There are a number of bays in engine room lower level, with narrow passages that pass through the center. I came down one of the ladders, and I swore I saw somebody walk across the ship about 15 feet in front of me. I could hear his footsteps as he walked around a corner and out of sight. Three problems. Number one, he was wearing utilities, an older light blue blouse, and dark navy slacks. Nobody had utilities anymore. They had been phased out three years earlier. Two, there was only one other person awake in the engine room that late at night, and he was standing at the top of the ladder behind me, waiting for me to come back up with an answer to his question. And three, he wasn't actually there. I wrote it off as sleep deprivation, but I'll admit, it shook me for a while. Fast forward to four months later. I had gone out to sea with another submarine of the same type. While I was there, I met a sailor who had previously served on my ship. After a few weeks of standing watch with him, he told me of a story of a sailor who had unalived himself while on watch when he served on my ship almost a decade earlier in engine room lower level, in his utilities. I wish I could have gotten a picture of the look on my face, but I'm sure that it was the definition of disbelief. To this day, that is the strangest thing that has ever happened to me. As a Marine, I used to have the graveyard patrol ship at the Beirut Bombing Memorial. Part of the memorial is dedicated to a veteran's cemetery. Oddly enough, I never got freaked out being completely alone in a remote cemetery in the middle of the night, surrounded by dense woods on all sides. It was actually kind of peaceful, to be honest. However, one night, I was patrolling near the perimeter fence where some of the oldest headstones are when I heard the sound of a woman humming. I followed the sound and noticed a light glowing through the vines and brush of a large tree. As I approached, I could feel my hair literally begin to lift as if there was an electric current in the air. I pushed aside the brush and what I saw nearly took my breath away. It was an old weathered headstone with a large cross etched into the marble. Only the cross was glowing a bright, vivid blue, like a neon bulb. The humming was also suddenly much louder and had a weird plurality to it, like it was coming from hundreds of voices at once. Needless to say, I freaked out. I screamed like a scared little girl and sprinted back to the parking lot I radioed the guard who was supposed to relieve me and forced him to come in early, and then spent the rest of my shift in the cab of his truck. I don't think he believed me, but he stayed in his truck and didn't go out on patrol until the sun was fully up, so who knows. A few days later, I worked up the nerve to return to the grave, during the day, of course. As I suspected, in the light of day it was a completely mundane headstone. There was no name only the aforementioned cross. I ran my hands over the stone and checked to see if maybe there was some sort of hidden light source or solar panel, but no, it was just plain, solid, unremarkable stone. 
and the humming was gone too. I eventually returned to my normal ship, but never again experienced anything out of the ordinary. I never learned whose grave that was either, but I find myself thinking about it from time to time. It certainly sounds absurd when I say it out loud, and I suppose it could have been some weird hallucination or a trick of my tired brain, but I don't believe it was. I think it was real. A ghost or spirit of some sort, but I don't think it was malevolent at all. When I was a child, my family moved to a big, old two-story house with empty rooms and creaking floorboards. Both my parents worked, so I was often home alone when I came home from school. One early evening when I came home, the house was still dark. I called out, Mom? And I heard her sing-songy voice say, Yes! from upstairs. I called her again as I climbed the stairs to see which room she was in. And again, I got the same, yes, reply. We were decorating at the time, and I didn't know my way around the maze of rooms, but she was in one of the far ones, right down the hall. I felt uneasy, but I figured that was only natural. So I rushed forward to see my mom, knowing that her presence would calm my fears, as a mother's presence always does. Just as I reached for the handle of the door to let myself into the room, I heard the front door downstairs open and my mother call, Sweetie, are you home? In a cheery voice. I jumped back, startled, and ran down the stairs to her. But as I glanced back from the top of the stairs, the door to the room slowly opened a crack. For a brief moment, I saw something strange in there, and I don't really know what it was, but it was staring at me. Years ago, I was on a cross-country trip, solo, to a family reunion. I was supposed to make it to a friend's house, but there was horrible weather. It was slow moving. Then a terrible accident happened just ahead of me, and I was stuck for quite a while. All told, I was five hours behind the schedule. I was exhausted, in need of a bathroom and a shower, so I pulled into a little strip motel off of a fairly back road state road. It was obviously small and dirty, but would work in a pinch. There was a window to the outside where check-in was. The guy there eyed me up and down. I was college-aged at the time, and I'm a female. He asked me if I was traveling alone. I went to hand him my ID and credit card, but he insisted on cash only. Red flags abounded at this point, but I scrounged together just enough cash and he tossed me the key. The room was dirty, barely bigger than the bed. The first thing I did was go to the bathroom, and then I flipped up the mattress. Dirty, signs of bed bugs. A moment later, I spied a cockroach. That was it. I was out. I decided I would use the parking space at least, and sleep in the back trunk hatch of my SUV. I curled up, using a suitcase for a pillow, and random clothes for a blanket, and fell asleep for an hour. I woke up aware of somebody talking on a phone outside and glanced out to see the guy from check-in standing outside. At this point, it was three o'clock in the morning. He finished up his call and then walked quietly over to my room, unlocked the door and walked in. He never turned the lights on and a minute or two later, he came back out, slamming the door behind him and cursing with another guy. I had never seen Guy 2 enter, so I still don't know where he came from. They angrily talked for a moment, then check-in Guy walked over to my SUV. 
I quickly covered up my head with a shirt. After he tried the locked door, he peered into the back seat. But between my tinted windows and blending into the general mess, he didn't notice me in the hatch. The two guys walked away to the far side of the lot, talking more, the one gesturing across the street where a diner was. While they were distracted, I climbed up to the front seat and started up the SUV. They turned around in surprise as I pulled away. I called my friends back home and told them, but I didn't want to worry my family, so I said nothing to them. When I got back home some three weeks later, we figured out the name of the hotel thanks to Google Maps and called the local police. They told me the place had closed down only days before I called. This was about a decade ago and took place along 250 in Virginia, I believe. The place was something like Mountain Top or Mountainside Motel. It was just a single story building, check in window in the middle, tiny diner across the street, and no other businesses nearby. My logic was that it was smarter than parking by the side of the road. Police took my info but never called me back, and we never found out anything from web searches immediately afterwards. At least one friend thought that I misunderstood the situation, and that there was some kind of logical reason. But I don't think it takes a whole lot to know exactly what these guys were up to. We were on this really long canoe trip in northern Ontario, like deep wilderness. We were on this gorgeous clear lake when we found a secluded beach. It was really beautiful, so we decided to stay there for the night. The whole day, and even sitting around the fire that night, just felt weird, but I couldn't really put my finger on it. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of soft country music. None of us had a stereo, so I stuck my head out of the tent to see what was up. There was a bald guy going through our campsite, picking up stuff as he went along. We made eye contact, and he put a finger to his lips and made a shh sound. So I hid in my sleeping bag. I can't remember what he took, but it wasn't much. Turns out there's a pretty significant hermit population in northern Ontario. This happened up at camp. We were playing soccer and someone shattered my leg and broke it in eight places. There was no swelling, so they said that I was faking it and they wouldn't take me to the hospital. They sent me back to the cabin for the night. I hopped around for a day, but the next night I was in too much pain to sleep. So I limped to the nurse's office, broke in, and took a handful of Benadryl just so I could sleep. That night, a group was doing an overnight in a three-sided shelter and decided it would be a great idea to have a peanut butter fight before bed. Well, one kid fell asleep with peanut butter in his hair and woke up when a skunk walked into the shelter and pulled a piece of his scalp out. The kid punted the skunk out of the shelter, which caused it to spray everyone on the overnight. So they had to take the kid for rabies shots, so they might as well take me along to get x-rays, since they were going there anyway, was the rationale. Long story short, you could have been blind and still pointed out the breaks in my x-ray. It was seriously damaged. And looking back, that kind of neglect is a whole new kind of horror. I was about 12, and I was at sleepaway camp. One night, the counselors randomly took us on a hike into the woods for a night hike. We were actually going to camp out there. When it came time to go to bed, of course, none of us were actually falling asleep. 
we overheard the counselors talking about the police looking for somebody. We later learned one of the kids was in the middle of a serious custody battle, and the dad was planning on taking the kid in the night. The reason that we were in the woods wasn't just to go camping for a night. It was so that he wouldn't find us at the cabin. No idea if it was actually dangerous, but looking back, it was definitely unsettling. This was the early 90s at a school camp. I got up during the night to go to the camp toilet. It wasn't far away. I could see it from our tent. There wasn't anybody around. On my way back, I spotted a man I didn't recognize, shining a flashlight into the side of the boy's tent to make shadows appear. When he saw me approach, he put his flashlight away and walked away, but was kind of hovering around the campsite. I thought he was campsite security, and that I was going to get into trouble for leaving my tent during the night. And, as I was an anxious kid, the thought kept me up all night. As I couldn't sleep, I noticed for a good hour or so that the guy was still walking around and shining the flashlight into the side of tents. I could hear him, and I could see the light. In the morning, I was falling asleep at breakfast, and my friends were teasing me about it. One of the teachers noticed and thought that I was getting sick, so she came over to ask if I was all right. I said that I had been up all night because of the camp security guard shining his flashlight into the tents. She looked horrified and said, what camp security? And then went off to tell one of the teachers. It turned out that the campsite didn't have security and the police were called out. Some guy who was known to the area for being a offender had recently been released from prison and was living in the nearby forest in a tent. I had just moved into a tiny town that was literally in the middle of nowhere and it had less than 100 people in total population. I was about seven at the time, and I had heard my parents talking about a dog that kept barking all night long, keeping them up. I wanted to help them, so I went out looking for neighbors with dogs to ask if they could maybe keep their dogs from barking all night. This particular town had a bad track record of houses catching on fire so there were a lot of old half-burned or ruined houses that had just been left to the earth. This particular incident happened within one of those ruined houses. As I'm walking around, I hear somebody call out to me, and I turn to see a very beautifully kept lawn in front of a nice white two-story house. There's a nice old couple sitting in lawn chairs out front, and the woman is calling me over, so I walk over to the fence. The woman asks me what I'm doing walking around by myself. I had only been living there for about six months at that point, but I knew everybody, and it wasn't that weird for parents to let their kids out by themselves, so I thought this was strange. But I tell them about the dog, and I ask if they know about it. The woman says that it's her dog, and she'll try to keep it quiet from now on, then offers me a full-sized Snickers bar. I took it. I know, I know, don't take candy from strangers, but there was a fence, and like I said, it was a very small town. I wasn't really afraid of anything happening. Feeling like I had accomplished my goal, I went home. At the time, I really wanted to eat that Snickers, but it had melted on my way back, so I stuck it in the freezer to let it chill. Then my friend comes over and we head over to her house, and I completely forgot about the candy. Wondering how the ruined houses fit into this? Well, when I returned home from my friend's house, I tell my mom about the nice couple and that they would keep their dog quiet. I told her which house it was, and she gets really confused. She says, what do you mean? There isn't a house there. 
I would have shown the candy as evidence, but I had completely forgotten about it. After some back and forth, we agree to go on a walk tomorrow in the daytime, so I can show her which house I mean. The next day, we walk down to where the house was, and there's no house. The well-kept lawn was just overgrown weeds, and the house was nothing more than a pile of rubble. Only the fence remained. I ran home to show her the candy that I had just remembered about, and that was gone too. I did have a little brother who was known for stealing things, so he might have taken it, but still. I get chills to this day when I pass by that vacant lot, and I'm 20 years old. I don't think I will ever forget that. I was driving down a dark back road with zero light aside from my headlights when I was about 16. I was with my best friend, and we were joking and being teenagers, when he says to me to look out for this box that was in the road. What I saw was a box, slowly inching across the road. Now, this was a night with no wind in the Pacific Northwest. There was clearly something in that box. I approached slowly thinking that maybe a raccoon or a cat was stuck under the box and needed help. As I'm pulling alongside it, my friend starts getting a little freaked out. I look at him, the car is now stopped, and I'm like, chill out, dude, we can set it free. He starts begging me to drive. I look over and I see that it's not a box at all. It's just a piece of cardboard, stood up on end, just slowly inching toward our car like it's walking. We were right next to it, so there could be no strings that were pulling it. And like I said, there was no wind, so it couldn't have been that. It took a second to register that what I was seeing was not normal. And once I did, I drove out of there super fast. To this day, I have no idea what that was. There was this abandoned school turned World War I military hospital near my house that a friend and I often broke into. One day we were rooting around the third floor and we found an empty envelope on the floor of a closet. It was old and the address was written in script. It only had a name on it, but the name was the exact same name as my friend who has a rather uncommon name. Needless to say, we got out of there pretty quickly and we never went back. I get insomnia. It was one of those nights, and I was sitting out on my back porch at about four o'clock in the morning, smoking a cigarette. It was one of those eerie nights, where there is absolutely no breeze and it's just completely quiet out. We have woods behind our house. And as I was just sitting there, I see this person making his way through the canopy of the trees, like jumping from tree to tree, 30 to 40 feet up in the air. I was absolutely stunned. And I just sat there dumbly, too afraid and confused to even get up and run inside the house. This person or thing or whatever it was, stops directly behind my house and looks dead at me. At this point, it's about 50 feet away and maybe 40 feet up in the air. It pauses for about five seconds, staring in my direction. I am absolutely certain that this was not an animal. Its body was human shaped and it definitely wasn't a raccoon, a bear, or any of the other things that people have suggested to me it might have been. By the way it was moving through the trees, it also definitely was not human. 
I don't care what kind of person you are or what kind of activities you're involved in. No human can move like that. It was way too dark to make out much detail of the face or clothing or anything like that. After about five seconds of looking at me, it turns away and just takes off the same way that it had been going before, just leaping from tree to tree at a fast pace. Within a few more seconds, it was out of sight. At my old apartment, I was brushing my teeth and my makeup bag flew off the shelf and slammed into the wall across the room. No windows, no fan. The bag was all the way on the back of the shelf against the wall. It did not fall. It flew like the opening pitch. I went straight to bed. The next morning I checked my phone and I had a notification from the Sleep as Android app. It records movement and sound overnight to wake you at the lightest point in your sleep cycle. I don't sleep talk and I live alone. I heard on the recording my bedroom door click and then creak open. It has a very distinctive creak and then a male voice talking lowly and the door closing again. I lived on the 14th story of a building with no balconies. You need a coded key card to get into the front door and to use the elevator or open the stairwell and then to open the door to the hallway and to get into the front door of the apartment and then get all the way to my bedroom. So if I go to the bathroom and forget my key card, I'm locked out of my own bedroom. It would be insane to break into any one of these apartments. I moved out a few months later. I was 18, and my brother, Chris, was 16. I also have a brother, James, who was five at the time. We had just moved into an older house that used to be three apartments. We just about finished unpacking, and we designated rooms. James's room was directly above the living room with the staircase. James went up to discover his new room, and Chris and I took a short walk around the neighborhood. We got back and we're just sitting in the living room, talking. My mom says she's going to go get pizza for dinner, and she leaves. She took a fairly long time, which is normal for her. I think she secretly enjoys the small breaks she gets whenever she can leave the house without James, and I never object to babysitting. Besides, James is plenty occupied with his new room. Chris and I are just talking in the living room. James is super excited about his new bedroom. We hear him running and stomping around upstairs, opening and closing doors. Sometimes he slams the doors pretty hard, but whatever, he's a kid, right? I assumed that he had fallen asleep because the noise eventually stopped. I hear my mom's car pull up and I go to meet her in the kitchen. My mom comes in carrying soda and James follows directly behind her, carrying the food, yelling, pizza time. She had taken him with her to get dinner. My mom confirmed this. Chris and I just looked at each other, taking way too long to comprehend what was happening. I lived in that house for four years, and that was the only time something really freaked me out. But we have no idea what was making noise in his bedroom for all that time. I was stationed in Seoul, South Korea several years ago. I was taking a shower in my room, and when I got out, the word leave was written in small letters in the fog on the bathroom mirror. I didn't have a roommate because NCOs got their own private room. A little freaked out, I decided to do exactly that, leave. 
I went off post for some Korean barbecue, and I wandered the city a bit. I came back a couple of hours later to find that the barracks were evacuated and half burned to the ground. The fire was pinpointed to faulty electrical wiring that caught some insulation on fire inside the walls. Something knew that it was going to happen, and to this day, whatever that something was, it didn't want me in the middle of it. I'll gladly thank whoever or whatever it is if they give me the chance, but it's been years, and I still have no idea. My girlfriend works as a television commercial producer and often travels to South America, mainly Argentina. One night, she woke up at about 3 o'clock in the morning to find a male hotel employee standing at the foot of her bed, just staring at her. When they checked the CCTV footage later, it turns out he'd been standing there for hours that night, and for the previous three nights. I arrived late at a hotel for a business trip. The flight had a malfunction, so we had to land. They fixed it on the tarmac, and we never deplaned. The room was already paid for, confirmation number in hand. I got there about five hours after I was supposed to be there, so they gave my room away. I already wasn't happy from all the delays, and I wasn't going anywhere. The event that I was there for was in their hotel. I wanted my room. I was polite, but resolutely firm. They did some scrambling and asked if I would consider a damaged room under construction. I said, as long as the sheets are clean so I can go to bed, I don't care. That was a mistake. The room they gave me was literally a crime scene. The case had been closed, so there were no legal issues to contend with. But somebody had been killed, or nearly killed, in that room. They had primed over the blood stains on the walls and the ceiling, but it only taped down semi-clear plastic over the pooled blood on the carpets. Multiple small holes in the walls had obviously been patched and sanded, but still, multiple small holes in the walls. They gave me a completely new bed and a television from on-site inventory so I was comfortable, but man, it was creepy. The creepiest part was that priming job. It was so obviously blood spatter. You could see where the person had been hit and where they fell. You could even see how they had tried to get up and where they had finally collapsed. Worst night's sleep ever. When I was like 14 or 15, I went with my family to Las Vegas, and we stayed off the main strip in a two-bedroom suite. It was a smaller casino hotel duo thing. My parents left to go out and enjoy the night, while I stayed in with my younger siblings. They slept in the bedrooms, and I was in the living room watching TV. I think I dozed off somewhere around midnight. When I woke up, I was in a stairwell, outside of the hotel room. I had no shoes on, I had no cell phone, and I had no room key. I went to the front office and told them that I was locked out of my room, and they believed me and gave me a key. I still don't know why I was out there. To this day, I have never sleepwalked. I have no idea what happened. I mean, maybe I did, but maybe something happened to me during those hours that I can't remember. Still. It was a creepy story that I'll probably never forget.
I was traveling out of the country right after finishing up a huge five-day work event, where I had about 10 hours of sleep total during all five days. I got to the motel, which was kind of run down. The carpet and blankets were damp, but I was so exhausted I didn't even think about it. I fell asleep pretty much immediately at like 8 o'clock p.m. local time. At about 11 p.m. or so, I get a call from the motel phone saying there's been a complaint about noise. I tell them that's impossible. I've been sleeping. They ask me if maybe it's somebody else in the room, and I tell them, no, I'm here by myself, so there's definitely nobody else making noise. They ask me again if I'm sure that I'm by myself and that I'm not causing any noise. I say yes again, a little annoyed, and finally fall back asleep, again immediately. When I woke up and thought about it some more, I realized how weird the entire interaction was. There was absolutely no noise that I could hear anywhere nearby, and I don't know why the motel staff would need to clarify so many times that I was alone. A little miffed by this, I went downstairs and asked them about it. Apparently, they never called. So I assume it must have been somebody calling all the different rooms to see who was in the rooms and how many people, trying to figure out who was alone. I have never been so glad to always use that extra latch chain lock. My spouse and I stayed at a massive hotel complex, which consisted of one hotel who bought almost every other hotel around it. We bought the online special and were put up in one of the ancient acquisitions. There was this odd 4x4 piece of plywood that was hanging down from the ceiling, just enough so it felt like somebody could watch you through the crack, but you couldn't see in. We hung up the do not disturb sign and went to tour around. We came back and the TV was on at maximum volume. We left and returned again and the shower curtain had fallen down. Good thing it was only a one night stay because that room just had the feeling of somebody being there. My wife and I stayed in a pretty well-known hotel in London. The rooms were pretty nice, but had a door which allowed someone to travel between our room and the one next to us. To do so, you needed to open the door in my room, and then somebody had to open their door in the neighboring room. There was only one handle on each door. One night, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I thought I saw somebody moving around. It being the dark and the middle of the night, I just thought it was my wife, so I went back to sleep. The next morning, I found my separator door ajar. When I was about five, I was visiting my grandma in the city with my mom, dad, and sister. We were walking toward the city center, so it was pretty crowded. I remember letting go of my dad's hand and then feeling him grab back hold of it a few minutes later. I kept walking, I don't know how far. I hear my dad shouting from behind me and grabbing my other arm. I hear him say, sorry, and I look up and I realized that I was holding hands with an old man that I didn't know. My dad assumed that I had accidentally grabbed onto this man's hand, thinking that he was my dad, but I remember him pulling me away all embarrassed. But I was just thinking, the man grabbed my hand. So basically, I think some guy tried to snatch me out of a crowded area. I still don't understand why my dad thought that I grabbed onto his hand. My parents were normally quite paranoid about strangers, 
He must have been distracted while talking to my grandma. But still, it kept bothering me that he apologized to the guy who basically tried to kidnap me. When I was 16, I had just gotten my license, as well as my first after-school job. Since school ended about an hour before I had to be at work, I would sometimes park in the adjacent parking lot and take a nap. This was a shopping strip with a grocery store, restaurants, and a bank on a fairly busy Friday afternoon. As I'm sitting there, drifting off, I see a black Denali pull up behind me, blocking my car in my spot. A gentleman jumps out, wearing a business suit, and asks if I can help him. He looks nice enough, and I'm assuming he's looking for directions. He starts to explain to me that his wife and he were supposed to be signing for a loan at the bank behind us today, so that they could purchase a boat, but she was stuck in a meeting and couldn't make it. He then asks if I wouldn't mind posing as her and signing the documents for her. I'm completely blown away, but I'm super shy, and for some reason, I felt the need to let him down easy. I said, Sir, I don't think they'll believe that I'm your wife. He then tells me, Oh, it's fine. I have her license with me, which he shows me. She has the same hair and eye color as I do. And he thinks that that's going to be enough so that they won't know. At least that's what he says. At this point, I am freaking out. I start to notice how disheveled he looks. He's sweating. And surprise, surprise, no wedding ring. I just want him away from my car. So I start telling him that I can't help him and he needs to go ask somebody else. He says, oh, it's fine. It'll be really quick. Just jump in my truck and I'll take you over there. Like I said, this bank was in the same shopping strip. There would be no need to drive to it. Even in my gullible teenage mind, I knew this story was complete bull. I'm telling him no over and over while scanning the parking lot for anybody who might be noticing. But of course, nobody has. He then starts getting irate, telling me that I'm perfect and I'm the only one that can do it. How beautiful I am. Can't he at least take me to dinner? I start trying to close my window. And that's when he reaches through and grabs my shoulder and starts trying the door handle, which luckily was locked. I am so frozen I don't even really react. I can't go anywhere as he's blocking me in. Suddenly, and I'm not really sure why, I just blurt out, I'm only 16. And for some reason, that freaked him out. He slowly backed away, got in his truck, and left. I called the police afterward, but they never followed up with me. I just know that he had found that license and made up the story as a way to lure women into his truck, and it scared the hell out of me that he would have convinced someone before. Unsurprisingly, but horrifyingly, years later I spotted him on the sex offender registry for assault. As a college student, I worked security on my college campus. Plenty of strange stuff. Walking through a chapel at three o'clock in the morning, when someone decides they should start playing Phantom of the Opera on the large pipe organ is an experience. High school cheerleaders seizing in the shower, suicide attempt, and a few burglars. Strange stuff. But the creepiest is that we also had responsibility for a church adjacent to campus. Not a huge church, and probably about 40 years old. I was doing my rounds, first walking the exterior, and then walking through the interior at about 3.30 in the morning. I hear a toilet flush, and then, 
I hear footsteps going down the hall, except that there's nobody in either the bathroom or the hall. In fact, I am standing in the hall and I can see the bathroom. I called the other staff over and we did a complete search, including the boiler room, which could have come from a horror movie. There was nobody there and there were no signs of entry. A year or so later, a coworker claims to have been walking past the church when he saw a lady staring down at him partway behind a curtain. It looked like she was from the 1950s or 1960s with cat eye glasses. So yeah, I'm pretty sure it's haunted. We had moved into a new place that was built around 1930. Sometime in the 70s, it had had a fire. My three-year-old, at the time, started running around the house and playing hide-and-seek with himself. Kids weren't allowed in our room, but our room was on the first floor, and the closet was actually the underside of the stairs. He kept running in there and shouting, Found you! Hide better! We didn't really think much of it, New house, kids have imaginary friends. Until that night, when he asked if Sam could sleep in his room. He said she was lonely, but they're friends now, so could she sleep in there with him? She doesn't want to sleep in the closet anymore. No one else ever saw her, and weird things rarely happened. We moved a year later, and except for the day we moved, when he asked if she could come too, he has never spoken of her again. When my dad was little, he used to spend a lot of time at his grandmother's. She lived up in the mountains, and she was one of those people who just took care of everyone. He said that he lost count of all the times that drunks or people on drugs would come in at all hours of the night, and she would always feed them, let them rest, and then send them on their way. She was a kind person, but also one who, what you see, is what you get, and she wasn't afraid to tell you what was on her mind. He said that he grew up not being scared of much because of her, and he thought the world of her. But there was one event that happened to him in the woods that scares him to this day. It's one of the reasons that he barely hunts or scouts alone, if he can help it. He was about 17 or 18, and he had stayed with his grandmother so that he could go deer scouting the next morning. The next day, he gets up early and heads out. My dad has a good sense of direction, but for some reason that day, he got turned around and lost in the dense forests of the mountains. He walked and walked, and night fell, with him still clueless on whereabouts he was. Tired, frustrated, and a little uneasy, he stopped to take a break and sat down. He said that it was just pitch dark, so much so that his little flashlight didn't give him much light at all. He was thirsty and starving, and he just wanted to get back to his grandmother's. As he sat there, thinking about where to go, he heard heavy footsteps and twigs snapping behind him. This scared him at first, thinking that he might have come across a bear. He stood up, knowing that if it was, he needed to get the hell out of there, but to not be hasty about it, so as to spook it. He just starts calmly walking away, hoping that he was going in the right direction this time. But the footsteps followed him. They were extremely heavy, thudding behind him a distance away. But as he walked, he noticed that they were speeding up. My dad starts walking faster, and as you can guess, the footsteps become faster. In a short time, he hears them now maybe a couple of yards behind him. Scared out of his mind, he turns around and shines his little flashlight to see nothing except these huge hoof prints. In their wake, 
The grass was dead, and everything around it was dying with each step. He starts freaking out, and straight out sprints, not caring which way he's going. He just wants to get as far away from whatever that is as possible. The footsteps behind him are following suit, sprinting after him. He only glances back once more, still seeing nothing but giant hoof prints and dead grass, leaves, and things like that wherever they had landed. By now, he's not sure how long or how far he's been running when he sees lights in the distance. He runs toward them, hoping that somebody can help him if he's come upon a house or a store. He breaks out of the woods and joy floods over him when he sees that it's his grandmother's home. She's sitting on the porch. The lights outside are on. His grandmother was a religious woman, so she was reading her Bible at the time. It's embarrassing for him to admit now, but he said that he started screaming for her, tears falling down his cheeks, and she stands up and looks behind him. That's when she sees the hoof prints and hears the sounds herself. She holds her hand out to him, and he grabs onto it tightly. She pulls him to her, and then says loudly, You can't have him. He said that the silence that lingered after that was intense. He had buried his head into her shoulder, so when he looked up, all he could see were the hoof prints and the dead grass and leaves. She just held on to him as he cried, whispering to him that he was okay and that it was gone. He has no idea what was after him that night, and he doesn't want to know, but he's pretty sure that his grandmother saved his life that night. My company would put us up in the Shiloh Inn downtown whenever we were in Salt Lake City. A co-worker of mine was awakened in the middle of the night by the sounds of a bunch of kids in the hallway. It went on for far longer than he could tolerate, so he opened the door to tell them to hush, only to find the hallway empty. He could still hear the children, though, so, figuring that they were in an adjoining room, he called down to the front desk to explain. The man at the front desk claimed to be certain that there were no children staying on that floor, but that he was certain the noise would subside in a little bit. He offered to send up some earplugs. My coworker was a little bit annoyed. He was like, how can you say that there are no kids here when I'm hearing kids? But he went back to bed and eventually he fell asleep. The next day when he was checking out, a different clerk made the mistake of asking the routine question, was everything satisfactory with your stay? My coworker gave her an earful about all the noisy kids and how the other clerk had dismissed his complaints. The clerk looked a little bit uncomfortable and then said in a half whisper, we're not supposed to talk about our history with guests, but please do a Google search for Rachel David and you'll understand what happened to you. We get similar complaints every few weeks and we try to never put kids on that floor. In the van on the way to the airport, he read on his phone the story of how a mother, Rachel David, had tossed her seven children off the 11th floor balcony of the hotel, then called the International Dunes, killing them all before jumping herself. Apparently, every few weeks, people on that floor still hear the children. When I was about four years old, my family ended up staying at Cedar Lodge Motel, where Carrie Steiner worked right before he murdered four women. My family drove to Yosemite, and it was a long drive for us. Three kids all under the age of seven, plus two adults, and a ton of mountains will do that. By the time we arrived at the motel, it was late. We were all cranky, and we couldn't wait to get out. 
But the moment we pulled in, something set my mom's teeth on edge. And she insisted that we leave and find another hotel, reservation or not. My mom has always had this like sixth sense and her gut has actually saved us a couple of times before. But my dad was tired and convinced her to ignore her gut and stay just for the night and the next morning we would leave. I can remember my mom actually refusing to let go of our hands, making us stay right by her side as she kept looking around while checking in. To try to get her to relax, my dad suggested that we go to the pool, thinking that it would calm her down. Well, when we got there, there were no towels, so my mom called the front desk. The moment the man delivering the towels arrived, my mom immediately grabbed us out of the water and rushed back to the room. The man gave her the absolute creeps, and she said that there was just this feeling of pure evil when he looked at us. That night, my mom and dad pushed the dresser in front of the door and had us all sleep in the same bed. The next morning, we left to go to another hotel, but my mom couldn't stop talking about how evil that motel was. About two months later, she and my dad were up late watching the news when they started reporting on a man who had murdered a young woman and two young girls in Yosemite. Just as my mom began to say, I bet it was that motel. They showed Carrie Steiner's face and said that it occurred at the Cedar Lodge Motel. Carrie Steiner was the man who brought us our towels at the pool. We have never gone back to Yosemite and my mom is always insistent that we listen to our gut feeling. And when every bone in your body is telling you something is wrong, get out.